Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome uh, to the, you would think that they would get a taller mic. <laughs> I've done this once or twice before. Uh, we're going to look into that. Uh, welcome uh, to the Stimson Center. My name is Brian Finlay. I'm the president and CEO here at, uh, at Stimson. And it is a great pleasure for me to welcome you all to this second uh, annual forum on the arms trade uh, conference. We're very deeply grateful to you all, especially on such a dreary day for, for, for joining us. As you may be aware, Stimson has a long and, uh, and proud history of convening researchers, practitioners, uh, private industry, and, and others to promote responsibility, accountability, and transparency in the global arms trade. We're pleased uh, once again to be playing host uh, to some of the world's uh, truly leading experts, uh, including all of you, uh, on the challenges and opportunities posed by uh, the global arms trade. Uh, I want to thank our co-sponsors for uh, uh, the afternoon. They include the Center for Civilians in Conflict, uh, the Arms Control Association, Win Without War, and the Security Assistance Monitor at the Center for International Policy. Thanks to you all. You will be hearing more from all of them, I think, over the course of the afternoon. The theme, as you can see, for uh, today's uh, discussions uh, is beyond the headlines, redefining responsibility in the arms trade, and it could not uh, sadly be more timely, I think. We are regrettably uh, living a subject that, is, uh, that really is torn from, the, uh, torn from the headlines. We meet here against the backdrop, of course, of continued U.S. military assistance to Saudi Arabia, to investigations into the suspension of military aid in Ukraine, to proxy wars playing out in Syria, in Libya, and in so many other war-torn regions around the world. Uh, and so today's discussion will delve much more deeply into uh, the role that the arms trade plays in shaping these events and other world events, uh, the risk it poses, uh, the opportunities uh, as well that exist to promote responsibility and accountability in the arms trade. Uh, we have uh, assembled for you uh, a remarkable lineup of panelists who will explore these and other issues over the course uh, of the afternoon. Uh, we've invited, uh, just as a preview, the first panel to examine some of the longer term dynamics of the, uh, of the global arms trade. The second panel will then turn to consider what responsibility in the arms trade means and some opportunities to uh, get some focused attention around that. And our third and final panel uh, we'll discuss how the popular media can be used as a means of educating, engaging, and uh, um, uh, uh, further reaching out to the public on these uh, extremely important issues. Uh, we have a panels, uh, we have multiple, as I say, panels of experts and, uh, uh, that will be here on the dais, and we have many more experts here in this room, and so we really are uh, eager to engage you in a discussion rather than a one-way dialogue uh, on, these, uh, on these issues. Uh, but first, uh, we have uh, the great honor uh, of um, having a distinguished member of Congress with us to frame uh, the day's discussions and, and, and kick us off. Uh, Congressman Ted Lieu has represented California's 33rd district since 2015. As a member of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, Congressman Lieu has uh, led on initiatives that span a remarkably a diverse array, array of important and challenging issues from climate change to human rights uh, to trade. He is uh, a veteran, uh, an officer reservist in the U.S. Air Force. Thank you for your service, sir. Uh, in addition, Congressman Liu has uh, been a leading voice for strengthening congressional oversight of critical nonpartisan foreign policy and national security issues in the U.S. Congress, from civilian casualties to arms sales uh, to the ability of the president to bring our country to war. Uh, now, if you have been awake since 2015, you will also know that uh, uh, since arriving on Capitol Hill, the congressman is never shy to uh, write a letter, to cross-examine a witness, to uh, develop and introduce pioneering legislation, and even to tweet <laughs> once in a while. Uh, congressman Liu has, uh, in that regard, uh, really become one of, in my view, the most committed and uh, influential and sometimes even entertaining uh, foreign policy leaders uh, in the U.S. Congress. He is a true uh, rising star in, uh, in our government. And more importantly, Congressman Liu understands, I think, the relationship between uh, principled American foreign policy, 
a responsible arms trade and really has become, as I mentioned, a, a leader in redefining what a responsible arms trade uh, policy means. Um, Congressman, I understand that there are one or two other things happening up on Capitol Hill at the moment, <laughs> and so uh, we are deeply grateful to have you here, and, and I think your presence really is testament to the seriousness with which you uh, take these issues. And so, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I give you Congressman Ted Lee. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Brian, for that introduction. I want to thank the Stimson Center uh, for hosting uh, this conference and to all their uh, participating organizations. Uh, let me begin by saying that having now dealt with the Trump administration for three years, it's always a thrill whenever I can stand in front of normal, rational, kind <laughs> people and look forward to um, having a discussion with you today about how we have an arms trade policy uh, built on our values. Let me start by taking us back to 2015. I remember I was uh, recently elected. I was still getting lost in the basement of the Capitol. And I started reading these articles in the media about the conflict in Yemen. And it was highly disturbing. I remember looking at the articles and seeing how the Saudi-led coalition that was supported by the U.S. were striking civilians nowhere near military targets. Uh, they were hitting civilians at weddings at markets, at funerals, at schools, and on and on. And as we started looking at more, it also turned out that they were using U.S. sold munitions with U.S. sold aircraft, oftentimes refueled by U.S. airplanes, and sometimes aided by U.S. intelligence. And as we looked more into it, it was clear to me that these airstrikes looked like war crimes. When I served on active duty in their uh, U.S. military, uh, when I was JAG. Uh, actually, I'm still a JAG. I'm still in the reserves. And one of their duties I had was to teach a law of armed conflict. Um, but it doesn't take a JAG to know that you can't just strike civilians nowhere near military targets. And then to do so uh, with U.S. weapons and, and U.S. aid was particularly uh, disturbing to me. So I wrote a letter to the um, chief of staff, the uh, chairman, uh, joint chief of staff, with a very simple request, which is, hey, let's stop aiding the Saudi-led coalition until they can show that they're going to stop hitting civilians. This was under the Obama administration. And so um, uh, we got a response to the letter. We actually uh, met uh, with some of their Obama administration officials, and they said things will get better. I said, okay. Well, things actually, in fact, did not get better. They actually, in my opinion, got worse. And so um, I started to work with other members of Congress, with U.S. senators, and eventually uh, more and more people got involved. And you may remember we actually had a vote on the House floor that almost stopped cluster munitions from being sold to Saudi Arabia. And that started turning a lot of heads. Uh, and then the Obama administration did, in fact, uh, towards the end of the administration, stop a shipment of precision-guided munitions to Saudi Arabia. And you might wonder, why would they do that? Why wouldn't we want Saudi Arabia to have more precision-guided munitions? Because it turned out that it wasn't as if the Saudi-led coalition was trying to hit um, the enemy and it was like a moving truck and they missed. What it turned out was Saudi Arabia intended to hit the targets that they hit. Uh, so, for example, there was this funeral that had uh, over a 1,000 civilians and Saudi jets came in and struck the funeral. Then they came back and struck the same exact funeral again, two very precision strikes. So it was very clear uh, that this was not uh, an issue where they were missing their targets. They were using precision-guided munitions to kill more civilians. And uh, the bombization, uh, to their credit, did in fact ban that shipment. Uh, unfortunately, under the Trump administration, they reversed that ban. Uh, and so we are continuing to um, fight with the administration to try to uh, put that ban in, but also get more sensible policy in ter terms of arms trades in general. And you may have seen that it actually has gotten worse under this administration because when uh, Congress uh, would not approve uh, additional arms sales to Saudi Arabia, uh, you saw Secretary Pompeo come up with uh, this uh, fake emergency declaration to try to get these weapons to Saudi Arabia. We had a hearing in foreign affairs, and uh, the administration official 
who was there admitted that for many of these weapons, they wouldn't even be ready uh, for six months to over a year. And that, in fact, there was no imminent threat at the time uh, to Saudi Arabia to justify bypassing Congress uh, to get these weapons sold. And so we're looking at ways to try to rein in the Trump administration. Uh, one of the things uh, I did is I introduced legislation uh, which would allow any member of the House to object and force a debate on the floor when there is uh, an arms sales proposal. The Senate actually already has that. I'm trying to get the House to have a similar requirement so that we can at least have more debates in the House of Representatives uh, and try to uh, shift public sentiment on issues related to, to, to arms trade. Uh, in terms of refueling, I know it's not exactly arms sales, but uh, we do have some good news. So we worked on trying to get the U.S. to stop refueling these jets that were then killing civilians, because to me it was pretty clear uh, we were part of the kill chain. And uh, in this most recent NDAA uh, language uh, that I wrote to uh, ban such mid-air refueling was, in fact, inserted and was signed into law. And so at least for the next two years, we're not going to be refueling uh, jets uh, that then go bomb civilians uh, in Yemen. Um, it's also clear to me that the whole sort of Yemen conflict shows one of the problems with the arms trade policy, which is it was largely on autopilot. When we start asking questions of, well, why were we selling arms uh, to the Saudi-led coalition? This was during the Obama administration. It was just sort of because we did. It's because they asked. I mean, there wasn't a lot of, in my opinion, a lot of thought going into this. And I think we need to um, put more thought into our arms sales. We shouldn't just willy-nilly uh, sell weapons to anyone that we want. And we need to think about uh, risk factors, of what can happen uh, to those arms. Uh, so the Cato Institute has actually put out a report uh, that uh, has a methodology for determining risk factors such as corruption and fragility in different countries. It does turn out that based on this index, some of the countries we sell to are pretty high on the risk index. And we've also seen that weapons that we've sold uh, poorly to our allies have then ended up uh, uh, in our enemies. And so uh, we have to understand uh, that arms can be fungible. And if your government you're selling to is not um, either stable or is high on the index of corruption and fragility, you could start uh, having those weapons end up in our enemies, either intentionally or because uh, the government simply doesn't have the controls to make sure they know where all their uh, weapons even are. It's uh, also uh, important to me that we try to shift public sentiments. I want to thank all of you here for what you do. I think uh, Abraham Lincoln had it right when he said public sentiment is everything. Uh, with it, nothing can fail. Without it, nothing can succeed. And, um, you know, in Congress, I just want you to understand what it's like. Every year, I well, went two-year cycle. So in every two-year cycle, I, I vote well over a thousand times. And um, I'd say 80 to 90 percent of those votes, I don't get a single email, fax, meeting, phone call. Uh, so when you start raising issues and you cause members of Congress and their staffs to go, why, why are we dealing with this issue or why are people calling in on this or why am I having a meeting on this, it's very helpful. And I can guarantee you most members of Congress don't walk around thinking about arms trade policy. It's just not one of those things that we think about very much. And we need to get more people uh, to think about it. Uh, so what you do in, in that respect is very important. What the, what the press does is very important. And then you never know what could cause changes uh, in policy. So we actually saw all of a sudden a lot more focus on Yemen, on Yemen and arms sales. Uh, was it because uh, there was you know, more killing of civilians in Yemen? No, that's not what caused it. It was because there was a murder of a journalist by Saudi Arabia. They killed uh, Khashoggi by luring him into a Saudi embassy in Turkey. And that sort of isolated act all of a sudden had these repercussions, which uh, then cause Republican senators to look into this issue of arms sales to Yemen, the Yemen conflict, and so on. So you never know, right, when public sentiment can shift, even on, on something totally unrelated uh, to the actual issue. And uh, it's important that we try to move public sentiment, just get more people to focus uh, on uh, these arms sales issues. And I think that you see at least the House of Representatives trying to take back more of our powers on the Constitution. So we've had a number of war powers resolutions that have passed. 
Um, we're trying to take back our war powers. And I think arms sales is another area where we have to start taking back a lot of the jurisdiction we've ceded to the executive branch under both Democratic uh, and Republican administrations. And my hope is that uh, we can move to a place where we don't just view arms sales as commercial transactions, but actually as instruments of a foreign policy uh, based on our national values. Uh, so with that, I am happy to, uh, to go an uh, answer any questions you may have, and thank you for having me here. Okay. Can you stay here? Yes, please. Great. I've got to turn on my microphone, but in the interest of making this conversational, we're going to turn this into kind of a, uh, a fireside-style chat. So be prepared with your questions. I'm going to presume the prerogative of the moderator here and ask one of my own, and then I'll turn it over to the audience because I need to get button pushed, um, like nine devices here. So Congressman, thank you so much for those uh, fantastic uh, thank you. and timely comments. I think you probably raised a number of issues that were top of mind. Yeah. Um, they'd prefer if you sit to my left, oh, actually. If might. <laughs> <laughs> or I can move there and you can yeah. sit. Am I actually to your left? No, <laughs> <laughs> no I don't know that you are. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Um, I think you, you talked about a lot of things that were probably top of mind for a lot of people, and yet I think you stimulated um, some thinking, even on my part, on, on issues that, that I might not have thought of. I do want to pick up on, on your last sure. um, sort of riff there about sentiment within the Congress and, and whether or not the Khashoggi incident allowed the Congress to catch fire in a bottle, in a sense, and develop the, the kind of bicameral, bipartisan support for... Uh, new critical evaluation of a particular arms sale and whether or not you see opportunity at this point uh, for a moment of reflection and maybe even initiative within both uh, both parties and also uh, both houses of Congress to take another look at how the Congress de deals with arms sales more broadly. Uh, so I do think the Khashoggi incident did get a lot more U.S. senators and um, House of Representative members to focus more on Saudi Arabia uh, on what's happening uh, in Yemen because of their sort of the brutality and just sheer gall of that killing. I think it made people think, huh, maybe this isn't the Saudi Arabia that we thought. Uh, maybe the new leader of Saudi Arabia is a monster um, based on this killing. And I think it sort of caused members of Congress to go, whoa, let's, let's look at our whole relationship with Saudi Arabia. I think it had some pretty significant uh, both short-term and long-term negative consequences for the U.S.-Saudi relationship. Uh, Donald Trump is going to be gone uh, either in a few months or one year or in five years, but most members of Congress, U.S. senators, are going to stay, and we're going to remember what Saudi Arabia did, not just in Yemen, but also with Khashoggi. And I think uh, that did cause Congress to go, okay, we have probably ceded too much of our authority to the administration when it, when it deals with some of our allies. And so now you have... Um, so I'll point out something sort of uh, uh, you wouldn't think of that also causes, uh, uh, in, in this case, U.S. senators to take more action, which is uh, last week we had briefings uh, on uh, Iran. The House had one, the Senate had one. But because the briefing was so awful, it caused two U.S. senators, uh, Mike Lee and Rand Paul, to just sort of uh, go off the deep end and rail against the administration, now get them to support, again, a war powers resolution at this time related to Iran. So you never know sort of what kind of seemingly isolated incidents could cause all of a sudden a focus on a totally uh, or, or uh, another uh, issue. Great. Thank you very much. Sure. Um, another, I want to pivot a little bit. Um, we we tend to focus so much on arms transfers to, to Saudi and really the relationship between conventional arms and, and armed conflict. But another issue that's really come up is, you know, the relationship between the gun debate here at home with small arms and, um, and handguns and the relationship between the proliferation of those weapons and violence in other parts of the world like Latin and South America. And this last year, um, following on from an initiative that was started under the prior administration, uh, the Trump administration proposed a rule change that would actually make it much easier or to relinquish some oversight, executive branch oversight of small arms exports to Latin America. We don't need to get too wonky into the regulatory side of things, but I just wonder if you have thoughts on yeah, how, I do. The, how the Congress might attend to that risk. Right. So we had a hearing on this, and uh, essentially the, the 30 second version is um, it's going to allow more grenades and flamethrowers to be sold to other countries. That's sort of 
basically what's, in my view, what's going to happen, uh, and as well as other small arms, and give Congress even less authority uh, as a check and balance on those sales. So I think that's bad, just in general. Um, unfortunately, we couldn't stop it. Uh, it was in the House pass version of the NDAA, got taken out during conference committee uh, because we were still dealing with, um, I mean, there's, right, there's three parties, the House, the Senate, the White House, two of those are controlled by Republicans, and they wanted it out, and so uh, we couldn't keep it in. Difficult challenge. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and turn it over to the audience now and, and call on folks in the audience. Please state your name, uh, your affiliation, and keep your questions uh, concise if you would uh, preserve the Congressman's time. We'll go first with, with Alex here in, in the front row who I do happen to Yeah, hi. Um, Alex Simmons from The Intercept. Two quick questions. Uh, first, on Friday, the Washington Post reported that the Trump administration tried to kill an Iranian Quds Force commander in Yemen. As someone who's been outspoken about the Yemen war for a long time, I was wondering what should Congress do in response to that revelation? And second, uh, more longer term, as you have seen the proposal to cut off arms sales to Saudi Arabia gain much more traction in the Democratic Party and become more mainstream, what should that mean for U.S. arms trade policy towards other autocratic countries? And under a future possible democratic administration, what should our arms trade policy be towards the UAE, Egypt, for example? So with Egypt, for example, it has a pretty high risk factor if you sort of look at it. Um, and I think we have to first acknowledge that we are selling arms to some countries that may not know how to control those arms or they may be not the most stable and we have to think about the long-term consequences of well what happens if if those arms get in, in the wrong hands uh, let me just go back to your first question uh, the administration not only do they not show imminence for the strike on uh, Soleimani they haven't shown imminence on this failed strike uh, in Yemen on, on their Quds Force person that you reference. And then what you see the administration doing now, both Attorney General Barr and the President have also suggested, well, they, they don't need eminence, uh, which is really shocking uh, because let's just boil it down very simply, which is the U.S. Constitution grants Congress the power to declare war. And Congress has only authorized two authorizations for use of military force, 2001 AUMF dealing with terrorists related to 9-11, 2002 AUMF dealing with Saddam Hussein in Iraq. We have done no AUMFs regarding Yemen or Iran or strikes against you know, the Iran, Iranian government officials or, 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 and so on. So the only other way that the Trump administration would have been legally authorized to do such a strike on either of those two individuals would have been under Article 2 self-defense, essentially, an, an imminent attack, a preemptive self-defense strike. Well, if you can't show imminence, then that will, those were simply illegal, unauthorized strikes, unconstitutional. And I think it's a very dangerous uh, and deeply alarming that you have the Attorney General of the United States in the present basically saying they no longer require eminence. Because if they don't, then that means they can strike anywhere, anyone, anywhere, at any time for any reason, essentially. And um, when you look at their argument, really, uh, it's now boiled down to, well, the person did bad things. That was their first argument. But now they're sort of shifting to, well, actually, I got the reverse. First, they said we're trying to prevent something from happening. Now they've shifted, shifted to, well, he did bad things. So it's not um, necessarily improper for the U.S. to take action either for prevention or for retaliation. But as Richard Haas said today in a foreign affairs hearing, that's what war is. That's why you engage in war, for retaliation or prevention. And if you take warlike actions, you're going to need the authorization of Congress, because that's what the Constitution says. And once you take imminence away, you're really talking about basically taking warlike actions. At that point, um, you, you need Congress involved. Great. Others with questions? Joe, did you have something? 
Hi, Jody from Transparency International's Defense and Security Program. Um, USIP had put out a report last year that kind of restated the empirical evidence, which was that um, violent extremism has gotten worse now than in 2000, late 1990s, early 2000s, and that a lot of that was, some of that could be put at the blame of U.S. security assistance, uh, including arms transfers, to authoritarian and highly corrupt regimes. Um, I just wanted to hear what your comments might be on that and anything that you think the Congress should be legislating regarding those sorts of issues. So you could have, uh, just because a regime is authoritarian doesn't necessarily mean it, it is bad in terms of um, whether or not you would sell arms to it, but it does increase the risk uh, of that regime either collapsing because authoritarian regimes don't necessarily, or they don't have the consent necessarily of the, of the people. Um, and many of them are in fact bad. Um, some of them are also our allies. Uh, and so, and so sort of, I, I think it's easier so, to talk sort of about risk to regimes in general. And I think we should have a serious conversation in terms of do we want to sell weapons to regimes that um, have high risk factors of either using these weapons on its own people or having those weapons get uncontrolled and they're lost to, to enemies of the United States. Um, so again, that's why I introduced legislation to force a debate in the House floor any time from any member, the way that the Senate could do that. Uh, I think uh, on the Foreign Affairs Committee, uh, we should uh, continue to do oversight of, of, of arms sales. Um, but a lot of it is uh, getting the public aware, right? Most people don't even know about various arms sales that we sell to various countries. It just sort of doesn't rise to, to, that, to that level yet. And um, it's important to try to get more public awareness of, of the weapons that we're selling to countries, including authoritarian and, and corrupt regimes. Well, we're probably streaming to millions right now, so hopefully they're getting the message. So. <laughs> right. yeah. We'll go over here yeah. to the left. We'll start with Bill over here. Bill Hartung, Center for International Policy. Uh, Bill Hartung, Center for International Policy. Um, Congress has stepped up to the plate on the Yemen issue, war powers, resolutions, voting against arms sales. President Trump has vetoed that. What can be done this year with him still in the White House uh, to pursue those issues, uh, given his uh, firm resistance? Well, there is an election in November 2020. Um, so the House will continue I think to try to take back some of the jurisdiction we've ceded uh, in the last few decades, I and mean, this has been happening uh, among both Democratic and Republican administrations. <clears throat> now, in the past, so let me take a, a little digression here about nuclear weapons. Uh, so we've always known uh, that the president can launch nuclear weapons uh, with virtually no oversight. So the way it works is the president wakes up one day, and during that day, uh, the president decides I want to launch nuclear weapons. The order comes down. It cannot be countermanded by the uh, secretary of uh, defense. No cabinet official needs to be involved. No member of Congress is involved. No member of the judiciary is involved. Uh, the military simply executes the command, and missiles launch. It is that easy. Uh, so Senator Markey and I introduced legislation. This was during the Obama administration, when everyone believed Hillary Clinton would be the next president, because we simply viewed the whole process as unconstitutional. Uh, and it would require the president to get authorization from Congress before the president could launch a premeditated nuclear first strike. Now, the reason that uh, that legislation sort of picked up more steam after Trump got elected is because previously, the American people, a lot of members of Congress, thought, okay, well, the president is the check and balance. The president would, of course, never launch nuclear weapons because the person was mad or agitated or, or pushed, you know, uh, in a certain direction. Um, and same with sort of arms sales. In a sense, people thought, well, the president is going to be somewhat rational and not sell weapons to our enemies and... and, and make sure that we have a, a coherent uh, arms trade policy. A lot was invested in the executive branch and in the president as a check and balance, just being the person that that person was. 
people now have started to doubt that in the three years of the Trump administration based on uh, their ability to see how the president thinks when he talks, the way they see how he thinks when he tweets, um, uh, the way that they see his impulsive actions. And so I think you are getting somewhat more focus on not just nuclear weapons, but also arms sales because of who the president actually is. Significantly less amounts of the American people and, and members of Congress trust the president. We come back over to this side of the room. Yeah, go ahead in the black. Alex, right? Yeah. Hi, Alex Stark, New America. Uh, thanks for being here. Um, I'm really struck that this is one of very few issues I can think of that is so genuinely transpartisan in the sense that it has progressive folks like you who are really active around um, war powers and arms control, but we also see more conservative folks like Senator Lee. Um, and the idea of Senator Sanders and Senator Lee's co-sponsoring legislation is, is really interesting, especially um, in this Congress. So I was hoping you could reflect on um, what makes this issue so sort of appealing across partisan divides and, and also how as a community can we take advantage of that momentum to push forward this kind of legislation? Thanks. So thank you for that question. Uh, my view is that Politics is sometimes like a circle. Sometimes you're so far right, you're left, and, and vice versa. <laughs> and so there be there are these interesting issues, um, such as arms sales. Another one is uh, privacy uh, and, and civil liberties. So what you saw uh, a couple of years ago is the Congress reined in our intelligence agencies because essentially they had been searching and seizing everyone's phone records, right? All 300 some million Americans. They knew who you called, when you made that phone call, the duration of that phone call, the time of that phone call, and also who called you. And can you imagine there are people who may not want the government to know that they called a suicide prevention hotline or Alcoholics Anonymous uh, or um, uh, some sex line uh, or a divorce attorney or whatever it is. And yet, the intelligence agencies were vacuuming up all these phone records, all 300 some million of them, without a warrant. You just can't do that under the Fourth Amendment of the United States Constitution. And so you have um, a number of members of Congress, regardless of party, uh, that are fairly strict constitutionalists, that when they see the executive branch overstep the Constitution, they will vote against the executive branch. So um, that's why you do have these interesting issues uh, many of them are constitutional issues where you do see very progressive members and Tea Party members working together uh, to rein in the executive branch. And again, you see this more now, I believe, because of who the president is. Uh, you saw it less, uh, even though, you know, for example, um, with prior Republican presidents, you would have Democrats not necessarily agree with them. Uh, they didn't think that that person may be unhinged or, or may be taking action solely for their own personal benefit over U.S. national security. And so you do, I think, see both Republicans and Democrats working together when the executive branch really oversteps their authority. I think we have time for one more. We'll stay in the middle because I've gone to the wings. How about in the, in the back row there, the gentleman in the green tie? Uh, Henry Hetka, retired government. Uh, I wondered uh, regarding what recently happened and the hostilities beginning with Iran in Iraq. Uh, the rockets came into that air base and nobody was injured. It was the first report. Then the next day we hear there was extensive damage, but they explained that we had some warning and that were people were able to go to their bunkers. So we didn't suffer any loss of life, but it was extensive damage to buildings and structures. Of that being the case, do they have ABM there, something like Israel's Iron Dome, our equivalents of that? And if it is there, why isn't it used? And if it isn't there, should it be there? Or in some facilities, say in Saudi Arabia, to protect our troops? What is your opinion on this? Right. So, so thank you for your question. If you look at the uh, consequences of Trump's uh, decision uh, it's very clear to me we're less safe now than we were at the beginning of this year. 
Uh, Iran has announced they're not going to abide by limits on their nuclear program. The Iraqi parliament has voted to kick U.S. troops out of their country. That was one of the top strategic goals of Soleimani. And then you had Iran launch a bunch of missiles uh, at U.S. troops. And um, thankfully, no one uh, uh, was injured. But that put our troops at, at high risk, and they're still at high risk, and I believe we are less safe now than, than we were. I think the facts are fairly clear on that issue. And then there are a bunch of questions about what was the actual legal authority for Trump to even be able to make this decision. And there's highly disturbing reports that this decision was you know, made seven months ago. It's not very imminent, right, seven months. Uh, so. Uh, in terms of actual defenses there, uh, I don't know the answer to that. So we'll look into it and, and get back to you on what defenses were there before the strike. Well, <clears throat> I think I speak on behalf of everybody here today in, in, in saying what a pleasure it's been to have you Thank for you. such a, a generous amount of your time and, and really appreciate uh, your presence here, but also I think your principal leadership and, and all the work that you've been doing. And also, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the hard work that your, uh, your really talented staff does with us on a daily basis. So, uh, so thank you very much. And in a reverse uh, gesture here, I want to introduce myself. I'm Dan Mahanti with Center for Civilians in Conflict. And, uh, <laughs> and we actually also wrote a blueprint on reforming uh, the executive branch's approach to arms sales. So uh, thank you all for, for your attention. And thank you again for coming, sir. And, um, and we'll see you again next year. Thank you, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> Thank Thanks you. a lot. Thanks a lot. Oh, absolutely. That was great. Thank you. Uh, don't get Good. that chance every day. Thank you. Hi.
right. Press your buttons. Press your buttons. Yeah. Or or you can wait. Actually, that's good thinking. Yeah. You can mute until uh, until it's your turn. Just don't. Yeah. You can mute until it's your turn. All right. I think we will resume. We have reassembled here. Hello to those of you watching on the live stream. We're going to try and stay as close to our uh, our posted schedule as possible. Uh, my name is Rachel Stoll. I'm the vice president here at Stimson, and I direct our conventional uh, defense project and have had the pleasure of working with all of these folks um, on the stage and many of you in the room for the last 20 plus years here in Washington. And it's exciting when we have a room full of people that care about the arms trade and not just those of us who are sitting in our office feeling like we're sort of pushing a... Uh, a very heavy rock up a mountain and having it roll uh, back on us over and over again. So I'm really delighted to be joined by um, our panelists today, um, but this is a discussion. So we will not just be talking at you. We would like to have this be interactive as we, um, as we discuss some of the, the issues that are really beyond, beyond the headlines. So first to my left, we have Adam Isaacson from the Washington Office on Latin America. Many of you um, will recognize his name and his face for years of working on these issues. This is, if you're looking at your paper agenda, this is not Andrew Miller. This is Scott Paul um, from uh, Oxfam America, and we're very grateful for him to, to join us today. And this is a face that you may not know, but you've probably seen her research um, uh, in the news. Uh, this is Dina Smeltz from the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. And we're really trying today to not just look at sort of regional issues, but how we put this in context uh, for those of us in the room that care about these issues, but also for those who maybe are less informed and don't necessarily write letters to their congressmen um, about, about the arms trade. So in a minute, I will turn to the panelists to talk about how the arms trade relates to um, several international peace and security concerns that we see um, in a variety of places around the world, um, you know, from the link of weapons flows to immigration and violence and crises in Latin America to the role that arms sales play in the Middle East and the conflicts there, and really how these issues resonate or sometimes don't resonate um, with the American public. We really want to take sort of a longer term view of how um, the global arms trade is illustrated in global affairs um, today. But those of you that know me know if I have a microphone, I'm going to use my moderator's um, prerogative to, to sort of frame these issues a little bit and really frame the day because it's a unique opportunity that we can all gather in a room for more than an hour and talk about these issues and why we really care about them because I think we've all seen arms sales in the news. And for those of us working on these issues, it's very gratifying to see an actual debate not just, you know, there's a blip in a headline, but an actual debate about um, arms sales. And we've seen that particularly with regards to Saudi sales, which Scott will talk about. Um, even if we're talking about the impeachment trial and whether or not the president withheld arms sales to Ukraine, proxy wars in, in uh, Syria and Libya and elsewhere, we're really looking at how arms sales are used as both a legitimate tool of foreign policy, but are also used to facilitate corruption, um, uh, facilitate civilian harm, or other irresponsible and abusive conduct. So my hope today is that this panel and this conference is really going to provide us an opportunity to reframe these headlines and allow us to view these issues and these incidents not as isolated pieces of news in our, in our papers, but really as an outgrowth of long-standing and systemic issues within the larger global arms trade. And while we're focusing quite a bit today on the United States, I think some of the lessons and some of the issues um, that we will be talking about are, can be reflected in global sales and, and policies of other countries. So one um, issue that I think highlights a lot of the themes of this conference and I think will be a common thread throughout um, the day is really, and is very prevalent in the United States, is really the tendency to prioritize the supposed economic benefits of arms sales over their associated risks. And we're going to be talking a lot about risks. Um, but we're, we're often told, and particularly um, in the current environment, that um, arms sales are powerful job creators. They're drivers of economic growth. Um, despite very strong evidence to the contrary, please talk to Bill Hartung if you, uh, if you need further information. Um, 
Meanwhile, we have ample evidence uh, that arms sales tend to increase the duration and intensity of conflict, the risk of atrocities, the risk that weapons are diverted to um, unauthorized and irresponsible end users. And so as a consequence, what we're seeing, particularly in the last three years, is that the United States and other arms exporters continue to engage in risky arms sales to particularly known bad actors. And it's not a surprise when bad things happen. So what does that look like in the United States and particularly over the last three years? So less than 18 months after um, entering office, the Trump administration released a new conventional arms transfer policy. And some of you may have attended events that we've done here in the past to talk about and unpack what that arms transfer policy looks like. And I think if you aren't familiar with it, let me summarize um, or let you know what I think is, is most important. And that is that the policy really demonstrates a notable shift in the U.S. approach to arms sales by emphasizing the U.S. economy and supporting the defense industrial base rather than viewing arms sales as tools to help achieve foreign policy goals and further U.S. national security interests, which are the longstanding tenets of U.S. law and policy on this. So the Trump administration has really focused on selling more weapons. We're going to hear about two um, regions of the world where that has certainly been the case. But it is important to remember that the United States is already the unrivaled number one arms exporter in the world. And that conservative estimates say that in um, 2018 alone, the U.S. Um, negotiated more than $55 billion of government arms sales and accounted for more than 36% of all global arms exports. We really are um, without a main competitor, despite what you, but what you hear. So the United States now sells more weapons to more governments than it ever has before um, and desires selling more weapons um, more quickly um, if, it, if it can. To be fair, and I think I would be remiss without to say there was one positive thing in this new conventional arms transfer policy, which is the first time we've had explicit reference to reducing the civilian harm that might stem, might, from the use of conventional weapons. And the policy mandates that the executive branch, quote, facilitate ally and partner efforts through the United States sales and security cooperation efforts to reduce the risk of national or coalition operations causing civilian harm. I would love to know in greater detail how this is being um, implemented and justified um, based on current news, uh, but at least it's on paper in some way and gives us an opportunity and a discussion and an entree point to have these larger discussions uh, where we see significant civilian harm and humanitarian crises. Um, we'll be talking specifically about two regions of the world, but I think that what is particularly noteworthy um, as we look at future sales is that the Trump administration's conventional arms transfer policy does not require um, the administration to consider the past behavior of a recipient country to be factored into its arms transfer decisions. So just because you have a record of using weapons not in accordance with U.S. interests does not preclude you from getting future weapons if you promise to behave properly. And that, I think, is a troubling aspect when we look at the two regions that we're going to talk about today. Um, so again, we are ignoring the behavior of human rights, counterterrorism, the potential for misuse. We're focusing only on future risk, which is still important. We do need to um, focus on future risk. But as long as you, meant, you, know, you, the recipient, say we're not intending to misuse these weapons, then the risk of such transfers can be overlooked. And you'll hear from my panelists why this is particularly um, troubling um, in the in the Yemen context, we just heard from Congressman um, Ted Lieu talking about the role that Congress has played to try and stop some of these uh, future sales. It would be great if we had, in his words, a more thoughtful U.S. arms transfer policy. I am less than confident that we will see that um, based on the behavior of the last three years for the remaining year to come, but that is where really all of you come in. We are only going to have time to scratch the surface of some of these issues today, um, so I encourage all of you to ask questions and think about other opportunities to raise these issues in the context of your regular work. I do want to mention um, the two other sort of uh, thematic approaches that the United States has taken in the last three years with regards to arms sales. One is stepping back from multilateral agreements and 
Uh, we see that across the board, I think, um, and issues relating to the climate, as well as arms sales and other internet and, and nuclear weapons, et cetera. Um, we've seen this administration say they will no longer um, find themselves to have to abide by the object and purpose of the arms trade treaty, which it had an instrumental role in, um, in, in uh, crafting. We mentioned uh, in the previous panel with Congressman Liu the move to um, change oversight of U.S. small arms exports from the State Department to the Commerce Department, which raises a whole host of other issues and um, allows the administration to um, usurp some of, of Congress's role. And I think there are many more examples that will come up in the, in the discussion today of where the U.S. is really abdicating its opportunity for leadership um, as the global arms exporter. So I will stop there because you want to hear from these very smart people, and I want to hear from all of you as well. Um, I think given sort of the news and the headlines, and that's where sort of we're going beyond, but we'll start with the Middle East because that's where we have, I think, um, in some ways, the largest discussion on arms sales that we've had in this country in more than 20 years, um, which is great. Not always the outcome that we like, but at least we're talking about it. So I'm going to turn to Scott Paul to share with us his insights on, on what's happening with U.S. arms sales to the Middle East. Thanks, Rachel. And I think um, I'm also going to try to be brief to make sure everyone here has a chance to speak and also my co-panelists who have probably prepared a great deal more than I have for this. Um, but uh, I think what I want to do with the short time we have together is basically just show you the battle scars of the past four to five years um, and try to unpack a little bit uh, what we've learned about the politics governing uh, arms exports from the U.S. through the Yemen example. So to take you back to 2015, um, this was the entry of the Saudi and Emirati-led coalition into the war in Yemen, major escalation in the conflict. Um, for the first seven months or so, um, it was very, very clear that the coalition didn't have a very good idea of what it was doing strategically, didn't have a very good idea of how to use U.S. manufactured weapons responsibly, and that generated, at the time, very little concern amongst U.S. policymakers. For us, um, we have been operating a massive, leading a massive humanitarian response in Yemen, um, reached more than three million people over the past four or five years. Um, our main concern was not only the civilian casualty incidents that, uh, that created massive headlines, but the daily destruction of critical civilian infrastructure and the economic backbone of the country that has essentially driven the humanitarian crisis by um, collapsing the economy and making public services uh, impossible to achieve for many Yemenis. Um, that's a, a gross oversimplification as many, many other uh, factors contributed to that. Um, but these were largely U.S. Uh, manufactured weapons, also uh, other countries, but largely U.S. manufactured weapons responsible for destroying schools, hospitals, bridges, roads, um, places of commerce, major, uh, major factories that served as employment and um, uh, sources for Yemenis. So uh, this was a major concern for us. Uh, and Oxfam, is, as I think many of you know, has a long history advocating for the arms trade treaty, um, felt very strongly that uh, its standards should be applied in the case of Yemen. So uh, when we get to November 2015, uh, there was roughly $1.3 billion of precision guided munitions that were noticed to Congress for sale to, to Saudi Arabia. And this is where we first got to take the pulse. Of where, where's Congress on this stuff? Um, what we figured out is that the, the traditional... Um, the traditional arguments we, we would make about the links between human rights and international humanitarian law uh, and the arms and, and U.S. arms exports um, fell pretty flat, um, particularly in the context of what seemed to be an overriding bipartisan consensus that the U.S.-Saudi alliance, alliance needed shoring up uh, in the wake of the JCPOA. Um, and what we got out of that push the few of us that were involved, was essentially an agreement between the chair and ranking member of the Senate Foreign uh, Relations Committee to, to require pre-delivery notification of those munitions. So if you want to think about the different phases of the, of, of, um, the conflict in Yemen through the lens of, of arms exports, you had that first phase, which is bipartisan inaction. Um, and you gradually get to where we are today, which is partisan action. Um, and there's been a lot of give and take sort of in the middle. There was a middle phase where it was clear um, that 
there was a democratic, mostly democratic um, opposition to these sales that was brewing with some very principled Republican leaders joining to the present day where the Democratic Party is virtually unified in opposition to these sales um, with a few Republican leaders joining, but the Republican Party now defending a, a Republican president's policy uh, to sell weapons more or less unconditionally to key Middle East allies. Um, so again, with limited time, what I think I want to, what I want to do now is outline what I think we've learned. Um, and there's some good and there's some bad. Um, good news is um, I mentioned a lot of what we made were basically consequentialist arguments, not principle U.S. shouldn't sell weapons because they're likely to be used in uh, or at risk of being used in human rights violations, IHL violations. We basically said you need to amp up the pressure on these arms sales because that's going to be an important lever for peace. What's, what I find interesting about that is on both sides of the aisle, those are the most effective arguments. In public, um, the people who are most sympathetic tend to talk mostly about human rights violations, um, and they're mostly Democrats. Republicans, who are with us and not with us uh, in their principled opposition, talk only in consequentialist ways. Um, there are very, very few Republicans uh, including Republican champions who have talked about, uh, on principle, the need to stop selling weapons uh, which are at risk of being used in human rights or IHL violations. Um, they have adopted publicly the rhetoric around driving peace, uh, getting attention of our partners, getting our partners to use weapons more responsibly. Um, and uh, it should go without saying that those who have not uh, agreed for, on the need to uh, oppose these arms sales have talked exclusively in geopolitical terms about what we need to do. Um, what's nice about that is that, because, is that the private dialogue demonstrates there's a new appetite to consider, um, as, as Rachel mentioned, how uh, arms exports can be used more creatively as a foreign policy tool. Um, in that early phase under the Obama administration, I think everyone would have said, yeah, these arms, arms exports are being used as a foreign policy tool to shore up a key alliance. Today, there are some people arguing uh, the same. There are some people saying we need to sell our, uh, these weapons for economic reasons. And then there's a new group of people that say we need to just be much more thoughtful about how we leverage these. I'm looking at Laura Lumpy in the audience, who um, I'm going to suggest first uh, was the first person I heard say, essentially, our diplomatic corps have been trained to think about, not, I, sh I shouldn't say our diplomatic corps, actually, my apologies, um, our ambassadors <laughs> are trained to think about uh, arms exports as a party favor for our friends. And there's some, there's some new good thinking about how we might use instrumentally arms exports differently. Um, and then the, secondly, there is, I think, now a widespread appreciation amongst human rights defenders that the Arms Export Control Act, um, while it's... Uh, my, my friends from uh, other countries tell me is comparatively a very strong legislative oversight mechanism for arms exports uh, needs to be strengthened substantially um, given the breakdown of the recent years. The bad, the breakdown of the recent years, um, the abuse over the summer of emergency procedures within the Arms Export Control Act to sidestep congressional oversight, um, co uh, corporate participation in the politicization of the Arms Export Control Act, um, here I'm referring to essentially a defense company that was warned by Democrats, don't go forward with this. Um, a hold is being sidestepped. The normal oversight procedures of arms exports are being sidestepped. So you move forward with this at your own peril. And they said, okay, we're moving forward. Um, and then uh, lastly, uh, I, we talked a lot about, <laughs> about the, the, rise, the rising importance of consequentialist arguments on all sides. Um, what concerns us as a longtime advocate for the arms trade treaty is the arguments in that, the, the principles in that treaty seem um, more and more relevant for, uh, I should say, more and more susceptible uh, to politicization and partisanship than ever. Um, and we see human rights arguments being made with respect to arms exports, but um, for a lot of people, we see, we see it as essentialized. Our friends don't 
commit human rights violations. That's what our enemies do. So that's the risk analysis that we need to do. Um, I'm going to stop there and pass it on. Great. Thanks, Scott. From one great news story to, to another, I think, when we think about Latin America and we think about particularly our southern neighbor, um, you know, there have been lots of headlines about immigration, about the wall, about um, danger at the borders. And we, I think, often um, in this country neglect to go a little bit deeper into why are people leaving their homes and wanting to come to the United States. And many times it is because of the conflicts um, that are being fought with the conventional weapons that we are, in fact, selling to the region. And there is no one I can think of more suited um, to talk about these issues than Adam Isaacson, who I have relied upon, I dare say, for more than 20 years of, tell me what is happening with U.S. arms sales to this region and what I should care about. So he is now going to tell all of you what you should care about uh, with regards to these, to these regions. More than 20 years. I guess we were 11 then. Yes, was, 11. Yeah. Fifth, fifth grade was a great year. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, I'm going to talk about Latin America. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you for the forum for, for putting this together. Thank all of you for staying after Congressman Liu. Um, you know, Latin America, if, the, if we were holding this in 2015, I would have been cautiously optimistic about the general direction the region is heading in. But right now, plainly, the region is on fire. And interestingly, the region is not really on fire because of what we traditionally know to be armed conflicts. Um, but it is still on fire nonetheless. But many things are happening. Economies are stagnating. Um, people are falling out of the middle class and becoming poorer. They're angry. Um, the region is only going to grow, only grew about 0.1% in 2019, and it's not going to grow much more this year. Very dependent on commodities. Organized crime, which is much more of a driver of the violence than armed conflict. Organized crime is more powerful than ever. Cartels. Uh, gangs, MADAS, uh, paramilitary groups, uh, other armed groups. They go by different names. Um, they make money from narco trafficking. They make money from illegal uh, precious metals mining. They make money from human trafficking, migrant smuggling, and just plain extortion and many other things. Constantly fighting over territorial control. Governments have gotten pretty good at taking out their leaders, uh, which just means they fragment, and there's much more borderlines between the gangs or the groups, which makes them that much more violent. Um, the result is that Latin America has 8% of the world's population. It has 37% of the world's homicides. Um, you've got angry populations. People are angry about corruption. Uh, more than one in five people in Latin America told Transparency International last year in Latin America that they had had to pay a bribe to get a public service. Um, a lot of this corruption has to do with ties with organized crime. Uh, their ties to government is the oxygen that these groups breathe. Um, People are angry about inequality in the most unequal region in the world. And there have been waves of protests even just in the past few months in Chile, Ecuador, Colombia, um, often put down uh, through rather lethal uses of non-lethal equipment, much of it sold by the United States. Um, people feel unsafe or they can't feed themselves because of what I just mentioned, because of climate, because of um, drought. Um, which has led to these heartbreaking images of mass migration that we're seeing uh, along Venezuela's borders, at the U.S.-Mexico border, at the Mexico-Guatemala border. Um, Venezuela has a historic refugee flow, like nothing we've really ever seen in the region before. In 2015, there were 30 million people living in Venezuela. Now there's 4.7 million that have left the country. By the end of this year, UNHCR thinks it's going to be 6.5 million out of 30 million that have left Venezuela because it is simply unlivable. The Northern Triangle, El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras, is also um, in the midst of a historic refugee flow, again, without an armed conflict. Um, just from these three countries in the Northern Triangle, 493,024, almost half a million children and families uh, were apprehended by U.S. officials on the U.S. side of the Mexico border in fiscal 2019. Uh, another 115,000 adults traveling alone. That's one in every 54 people from those countries was apprehended in Texas, Arizona, New Mexico, or California last year. And Mexico apprehended another 150,000 more. It's a mass mi migration. This, of course, has caused a lot of freakouts in the White House about caravans, you know, threatening tariffs on Mexico and things like that. But the result of those freakouts is that right now the right to seek asylum in the United States, at the border at least, basically doesn't exist now. Um, asylum seekers are having to wait in Mexican border towns. Some are having to, being shipped to Guatemala to go uh, apply for asylum there. Soon some will be sent to Honduras. 
You've got wall building using dubious emergency claims, uh, moving money out of other DOD accounts into building wall along the border. Um, you've got an almost unprecedented long-term use of active duty U.S. military on the U.S. border to try to keep this out with untold harm that that's going to cause for civil military relations here at home, forcing Mexico to crack down with a brand new force called the National Guard that right now is mostly military, um, although it's supposed to not be in the long term. Um, you know, be, be other things that are on fire. Uh, Mexico saw more homicides last year than any, in any year in its history, breaking the record set the year before. Brazil has elected a far-right populist government. In, in, in 2018, police in Brazil killed an average of 17 people a day, and that went up last year. We don't know how much yet. Um, Colombia, you know, I've even mentioned Colombia, which has the tradition of being the country, one I've worked on for many years, uh, with the worst armed conflict and the most uh, notorious violence, sort of the sick man of South America. Colombia is maybe not even on fire in comparison to a lot of these other countries. It's certainly smoldering. Um, but, you know, 15 years ago, there were 50,000 people out as members of guerrillas or paramilitaries running around the country with arms. Uh, that's down to maybe 12 to 13,000 now, in part because of a somewhat successful peace uh, accord in 2016. That number, however, from 12 or 13 is going the wrong direction. It is increasing right now as they're running into problems implementing the, the accords. So we can expect this fire in the region to keep burning in 2020. Um, we're going to keep seeing mass migration, um, and the White House isn't going to be able to keep sweeping it under the, the rug for very long. Now, the flow of weapons to the region is certainly a big source of gasoline uh, being pumped onto this fire. Here in Latin America, the story is small arms, uh, which are very easy, easy to access. And I would say it's more of a trafficking story than an official arms transfer story when we're talking about small arms. You know, you've got a lot of Cold War aid to Central America back when we were, you know, negative numbers, when the Reagan administration was uh, aiding Central America uh, and, and the Russians were aiding Central America also. After those wars ended in the 90s, you could buy an AK-47 in the market in a town in Nicaragua for $50, $75. Um, a lot of those weapons made their way into Colombia's conflict where they're not needed now and they could be circulating around more now. It's hard to get information. But a lot of it, the source of these weapons is closer to home, too. Gun shops and gun shows in the United States, uh, particularly in border states, but really everywhere. It's very hard to buy, a gun Ill to buy a gun legally in Mexico. There's only one gun store run by the defense ministry. And if you want to get your hands on an AR-15 or something similar, you've got to get it through the black market. And a key conduit for the black market are straw purchasers who buy guns at U.S. Uh, gun shops and gun stores, often in small amounts, one or two guns at a time, usually bringing it back across the border in vehicles. Uh, they call it tráfico de hormiga, ant trafficking, uh, moving it across and, and making quite a bit of money that way, one by one, and finding its way into the hands of organized crime. Uh, groups like the, the Sinaloa, Jalisco, Golf or Zetas, or other, many of the other unfortunate cartels that are uh, operating in Mexico right now. Uh, a 2016 report from GAO um, showed 70% of guns that were recovered at crime scenes in Mexico um, by Mexican authorities submitted for tracing had a U.S. origin. Uh, that was 20, 2009 to 14 data, but ATF data for 2011 to 18 show about the same percentage. More than two in three weapons come from U.S. gun shops, gun, sh gun shows, usually made in the United States, but it's at least sold in the United States. That same GAO report found that uh, between 2014 and 2016, 49% of crime guns seized in El Salvador had, it, were, had originally been purchased in the United States. 45% of guns in, in Honduras um, were purchased in the United States. In addition to that, from official sales, you have a problem with leaky stockpiles. It's been a chronic problem in Guatemala that the official security forces, usually for reasons of corruption, are leaking guns that end up into the hands of organized crime. Just um, uh, two weeks ago, um, Mexico has had a new government from the center left in the last year. The, the security secretary of that government announced that he, they estimate that in the last nine years, 50,000 small arms may have leaked from Mexican uh, official stockpiles, uh, from municipal, state, federal police, as well as the military. <clears throat> Venezuela, it's a little less clear where the weapons are coming from. A lot of it could be leftovers from Colombia's conflict, and certainly Colombia's armed groups may be making money that way. 
in 2006, Hugo Chavez announced they were going to open with, with actually Mr. Kalashnikov himself came to Caracas to, about, for the supposed opening of an AK-103 factory. Uh, that still hasn't opened yet because things don't really happen very efficiently in Venezuela, but they're talking about a 2021 opening for that factory, which will make things worse. Venezuela does have huge existing stockpiles. They had a lot of oil money that even before Hugo Chavez, they were spending on armaments. Uh, many Russian arms purchases during the Chavez and Maduro years. And even now, corrupt officials may be importing weapons from the United States. There was, a, in February of last year, an airport seizure of heavy weapons uh, from a flight from Miami. Um, so what can we do about all of this? I mean, we have to start putting out the fire or at least stop this flow of gasoline that's going on the fire. Um, in the region, combating corruption is crucial to this. Actually throwing a few people in jail um, uh, for collusion with organized crime, for facilitating arms trafficking, for allowing stockpiles to leak, uh, would have a demonstration effect. Even emblematic cases would have a demonstration effect in those countries that could um, reduce uh, that kind of corrupt behavior in a big way. Not selling to countries, or at least to units, with a history of serious leaks uh, or, or, uh, from stockpiles or organized crime collusion would also be hugely helpful. The Leahy Law only covers human rights and not even sales. Uh, it does not cover corruption or arms transfer leaks. The United States should have a strategy, uh, a strategy for southbound weapons, which it really doesn't have now. It has Homeland Security investigations, ATF. They do their own um, uh, investigations of particular cases, but they're not getting to the nodes on the network. Um, and there's not enough of a concerted effort to go after uh, these uh, um, straw purchasing networks. Um, a federal database of gun serial numbers and transactions in the United States. What gets sold? Um, in U.S. gun stores and, and, and gun shows would be an enormous help in tracing this back to the perpetrators, um, but those records don't exist right now, um, and you have to go up against the U.S. gun lobby in order to make it happen. Obviously, close to this would be tightening up the gun show loophole as well. Um, so domestic gun laws are a huge part of this. Um, absolutely, as has been said before, don't move the licensing of gun sales uh, from state to commerce. It's been estimated that that would increase exports to the region uh, by 20%. Um, again, have Leahy apply to small arms sales, although it obviously um, poses um, difficult end use challenges. Small arms and ammunition are very easy to transfer from one unit to another, but still a huge, uh, it would be an important step. More transparency from suppliers everywhere. I mean, the data we have on this is, are just terrible. I've given you some, but it's very hard to get, especially if it involves non-US countries. And in the meantime, while we're even trying to fight to get all of this through, um, while U.S. weapons continue to contribute to mass refugee flows all around the region, the United States has a responsibility to accept more refugees than it has been and allow those who seek asylum to at least apply for it and get due process here in the United States because our guns are part of the reason that they're coming. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Adam. That was, um, I don't know, more depressing than That's usual, why I'm here. I think. <laughs> uh, you know, I think it does, though, put this in context that when you scratch the surface of, of the headlines, when you look beyond, you know, the numbers of how many refugees are coming, you see not only the complicity of the governments to where they are trying to get to, but also really some of these root causes that are not just things that have happened in the last three years or the last five years, some of which... Um, you know, are really decades in the in the making, and I think amplifies the the responsibility that we have to try and um, you know, as civil society, as governments, as industry, to really think about you know how we can clean up some of these messes that have been that have been really longstanding because there are generations um, at play both in the Middle East and and Latin, throughout Latin America that are are growing up in environments which are not safe um, and that we can do something about. So do people care about this, Dina? This is the magic question, right? Do Americans, when they get the true story of what is happening and they dig a little deeper, where do U.S. Um, uh, citizens sort of fall in their uh, awareness of these issues, but also on how they care about these issues and what are those le points of leverage um, that we can get them to write their members of Congress to care about. So I'm going to turn it over to Dina. She, we do have PowerPoint. I know that sometimes makes people a little nervous. Just a few slides. Just a few slides. And so she's going to stand, but I promise it's still informal and we're still having a discussion. Um, <laughs> so, but just so that you all can see, it's hard to visualize, I think, polling data. Um, we'll we'll uh, we'll move to the to the slide. Yeah, there's nothing worse than listening to a presenter just recite a bunch of numbers. So I thought at least if you could see, the, visualize it. It doesn't matter so much what the exact number is if you can just compare the bars and the 
and the lines. Um, there is an impression in the United States that the American public is disinterested in preventing the flow of arms around the world and also that they're completely unaware of the flow of arms around the world. Um, at the same time, though, domestic gun rights groups like the NRA do try to link uh, the international arms issue with domestic gun control in a way that can block, for example, the adoption of the um, arms control treaty, arms sale treaty. Um, there is a real need for more data on this. this. is something that Rachel and I have been talking about a lot. There's a need for objective empirical data on what the American public thinks about international arms trade, the importance of US leadership on the issue, the utility of the arms trade treaty in particular in those efforts, and how easily manipulated American public views are on the issue. So, there's been just a limited number of polling on the issues. Here's what we know in these six slides. Um, in June 2019, the Chicago Council, where I work, uh, conducts a survey every year. It has been conducting these surveys since 1974, so it's one of the longest running surveys specifically devoted to foreign policy. So in 2019, we pulled out this question that uh, we hadn't asked before. And it was the first time we'd asked about arms sales in a really long time. And we asked a series, we asked uh, Americans whether a series of foreign policy approaches makes the United States more safe, less safe, or no difference. Now, out of 14 different items, selling weapons to foreign countries was rated as the approach that makes the United States the most unsafe. 70% said uh, that. 70% overall said that selling arms to other countries made the United States less safe. And this was uh, the question earlier about, um, there was a comment about it seems like this issue is so transpartisan in Congress. It's also transpartisan uh, among the American public too. And while it used to be that the Republicans and Democrats among the public shared a lot of foreign policy views, it's becoming more polarized uh, every year since the Iraq war, really. So this is one issue where it's really unified. Um, the second least safe approach was intervening militarily in other countries, with 46% saying that makes the US less safe, which I see is somewhat related to the arms sales, too. If you're interested in getting these slides. Rachel has them. I can send them to you. Also, the full report, which covers all 14 of these issues and more, is on our website, so I'm happy to, to share that with you after. Um, okay, so before 2019, we asked a longer-term question on whether Americans favor or oppose our government selling military equipment to other nations. So you can see the dark blue is the overall um, number. So at its highest point during the Cold War in 1986, 39% of Americans overall favored selling military equipment. But by 1998, this had dropped substantially to 15% overall. Um, then it's gone up a little bit since then, but still uh, it's now overall at 22%, but so much lower than it was during the Cold War. Um, in the 80s, if you look at the red line, nearly half of Republicans um, supported, um, sorry, this is favored, yeah, supported uh, our government selling military equipment, but that too has fallen substantially. It's actually half. So support for the general sale of weapons is pretty low, according to the trend polls, also our most recent numbers. Um, we also have some historical case studies. Um, it's interesting, when I briefed some of our overall results, this was one point that on Congress, on the Hill, it was to a bunch of committees, and this was one point that people had a lot of questions about the arms. They really wanted to know, well, what about if it was an ally, or what if it was an ally versus a country that you know we weren't allied with? So in looking at our past surveys, we have asked about in Taiwan uh, and the case of Saudi Arabia, which are allies, and we asked about Syria, Ukraine. I imagine in the 70s we probably had some Latin America, 
too, but uh, what I pulled out for examples were these four, Taiwan, Syria, Ukraine, and Saudi Arabia. Um, it's kind of small. It's, uh, I can read them to you. So uh, basically, what I wanted you to take away is that if you look in the oppose column, a majority opposed um, selling arms in every single case. And in the Saudi case, we asked, there's a YouGov, not our poll, but a 2018 survey asked, do you support or oppose the U.S. policy of selling weapons and other military equipment to Saudi Arabia? 54% opposed, 21% supported, right? But, and after all we've heard about the recent attention to Saudi Arabia, you might think, yeah, well, that's because it's now, it's been in the news, it's more salient to people. But I pulled out this 1981 question about the Reagan administration. I have to hold it like this because I didn't bring my glasses up here. The Reagan administration wants to sell advanced radar planes and additional weapons for other planes to Saudi Arabia. Do you favor or oppose the proposed sales, or don't you know enough to have an opinion? So again, 54, it's exactly the same number. I'm looking at 54 and 54 um, in 2018. So it's not as um, volatile with the news as you might think. Um, in Ukraine, it was a little bit more divided. Also, this, the Ukraine Sending arms and military supplies to the Ukrainian government, 56 to 40, but again, and this really upset my boss, Evo Daughter, because he had just written a piece about uh, sending lethal weapons to Ukraine in support of it, and our polls showed uh, that Americans were more likely to not support it. But um, it was more divided. Also in Bosnia in the 80s, it was very divided, but those questions often included a humanitarian aspect, which again, you know, public opinion is very uh, influenced by the wording, by messaging, and that's one lesson that, I, and one reason that we really need to know more about it, what are the pros and cons and how they affect uh, these attitudes. But when you just ask straight questions without any uh, arguments to influence, it's really striking how consistently the public does oppose the sale of weapons to other countries. So I have another older question from 2018. We asked um, about a series of international agreements. Americans generally do support international agreements. Um, we found, in this case, a majority of cross-political party supporters favored an international treaty to regulate the trade in small arms, such as handguns, rifles, automatic weapons, and light weapons, grenade and rocket launchers, landmines, and mortars. And overall, 68% said the U.S. should participate, 31% should, said should not. This number, this uh, proportion, 68, 31, two-thirds, one-third. We also see that on questions about multilateralism and the UN, whether the United States should go along with a decision um, that the UN makes, even if it's against a policy option that the US wanted. It's two-thirds, one-third, so there's um, consistency in that as well. Because obviously, they don't know, Americans don't know a lot about what's in a treaty, but it's just their general tendency to uh, want to work in a multilateral framework. Um, so what that says is um, the support is soft for these treaties, right? That the public can be susceptible to both positive and negative messages. One example is the Iran agreement. When we first started asking about it in 2013 or 14, the idea of an agreement, we found majorities opposed it. Then when Netanyahu came and the, um, the criticisms became really loud, we saw it fall across the board, but especially among Republicans. And then the last time we polled, even after we withdrew, it was back up. Even 53% of Republicans supported it. So it's, it's, again, to show you that whoever gets uh, the attention and the whoever is informing the public can have um, a clear opinion. The other side of it is that while fewer oppose 
um, certain agreements like this one then support it, the support among the opponents might be stronger and more focused and more um, intense than the supporter. So you have to keep that in mind too, as in any campaign. Um, and then one final question from 2019. Sorry, 2010. Uh, between 2004 and 2010, um, a majority favored giving the UN the power to regulate the international arms trade. 55% in 2010, 44% um, recently. This has narrowed over time the support and opposition. And it underpins general support for multilateralism again. So that wasn't too bad. That wasn't so many numbers and so many slides, right? Um, so because the public can be swayed by the various arguments, Rachel and I and any others who want to join our bandwagon are looking for um, some ph philanthropists and generous-minded individuals to fund a short-term high-impact polling project to <laughs> study um, American attitudes toward international arms trade. We really need to understand how much Americans know at the baseline. Um, do they support more regulations? Uh, what, are the, what are the issues that they think would be beneficial? What are the issues that they think it would harm? Um, we just want to open the political space for more debate and a, a more informed public, but also among policymakers who more, are more informed about what the Americans want. I mean, these data alone, even if we can't do a follow-up survey, would be useful for people on the Hill to know and people around the world to know. Um, so we, yeah, we're hoping that if we can get the uh, poll going, the results will be used to educate policymakers and the media about the realities of what the public thinks and try to counter the mischaracterizations that are used by others. Um, one thing I would really like to look at is how support for domestic gun control relates in one survey with, um, with international arms um, control because I've never seen it together in one survey and people always assume that they're connected, especially in terms of uh, not adopting international arms regulations, but it could be the other way around that because they do support arms control domestically that they would then want to adopt it internationally and see the problems overseas as well. So thank you very much. Thank, thanks, Dina. I, get, I think um, that was less depressing than, uh, than, than Adam. And Scott, hard to um, do. It yeah. is, you know, it is. It, but it's, it still, I think, really demonstrates that we have a very long way to go to explore the nuance of these discussions. And that, you know, at a surface level, if you ask basic information, you get one answer. But if you start adding sort of some leading language or messaging about particular issues, it's very hard to ask questions and say, you know, do you want U.S. weapons to be used to kill innocent civilians? That is obviously not going to have a, a significant amount of support. But when you say, do you want to support your partners and allies who are fighting um, a terrorist threat, right, you're going to perhaps get a very different set of answers. Um, I do want to open the floor to questions. I think, though, I'd like to pose a question to both Adam and, and Scott and to, to Dina in one extent that we're really focused very much today on sort of the U.S. role and the link between sort of the, the larger U.S. political concerns and, um, and the, the uh, resulting um, crises, conflicts, humanitarian um, and civilian harm. There is often, and it is, if you've seen my clip on Forum on the Arms Trade, which um, to tout that website, one of my biggest pet peeves is, well, the U.S. has to sell these weapons or somebody else is going to, and so we can control better the policies of these governments as well as the end use of these weapons if we're the ones that sell it. I could go on and on and on about why that is a horrific argument, but I'm wondering in both the cases of Saudi Arabia and any or all of the of the countries that that um, that Adam mentioned, particularly because of the legacy issue, are there other players in this space? Is the U.S. competing against itself, 
in the region to sell more and have more influence against a threat that doesn't actually exist except one that we are generating and creating? And perhaps, you know, then you can talk about how the U.S. views that. Um, short answer. Make sure you turn your, your yes. mic back Yes, I think on. I'm back on. Yes, okay. Um, short answer, yes. Um, and I say that without a rich expertise about the landscape of the global arms trade, but with a very um, clear insight into uh, Saudi Arabia and the UAE and Yemen as a test case. And I say that because we actually saw, um, we actually saw the two alternative theories of the case both at work, right? First, under the Obama administration, we saw what kind of influence we get with our partners because we are a reliable uh, uh, arms, uh, arms vendor? The answer is very little, particularly when uh, we're talking about trying to influence uh, a military campaign that the leadership of our partner views as um, existential and non-negotiable, right down to the, you know, the tactical level um, in many cases. You can talk to our dear colleagues who worked in the State Department who were over there on a regular basis. They said, well, um, we have a patch that will dramatically improve your target selection. Um, we're not even going to talk about infrastructure because that's another conversation, but here's how you kill fewer civilians and injure fewer civilians. Um, and as a matter of uh, political will, it wasn't going to happen. So that's the one side. On the flip side, we've seen what happens when the threat of no arms sale is credible. So what's happened in the past three years? Um, in the first instance, a massive threatened offensive to capture a key, the key port city of Hodeida, which would have interrupted a key import stream and pushed millions more into famine, I should say millions into famine, was averted not once but twice largely because of the threat of no arms sale. Um, the United Arab Emirates made what seemed to be an instantaneous decision to dramatically reconsider its role in the conflict. Not, always, not, not completely in a responsible way, um, but very dramatically and very, very linked to its military uh, uh, relationship with the United, the United States. And now Saudi Arabia has dramatically scaled back its airstrikes and has put itself forward um, with a great deal of urgency into two parallel peace processes. I think I saw a statistic that in December, um, there were six airstrikes that the Saudi-led coalition conducted throughout the whole of Yemen. When I first went to Yemen in 2016, that was called a peaceful night. So there's actually a very, very clear um, uh, line between uh, the pressure that Congress exerted on arms sales and the change in policy on the ground. Sure. Other actors, I mean, I'd say, for, first for trafficking, the, the further south you go away from the United States, the less likely it's going to be that trafficked weapons have a U.S. origin. Um, so when you get down into South America, I mean, it still happens, but um, it's much more democratized. For official arms transfers, Mexico, Central America, and the Caribbean, except for Cuba, the United States has, dominates the market. Um, according to the State Department's World Military Expenditures and Arms Transfers uh, reports in this past decade, those, that part of Latin America, the northern tier, if you will, more, uh, roughly 90% of their arms purchases overall were from the United States. And Mexico increased them significantly after the Merida Initiative aid package of the late 2000s, and then um, the Peña Nieto government made a bunch of big purchases. South America is a bit more of a mixed bag. Um, according to that report, the United States accounted, first place, accounted for 42% of arms sales to South America continent. Russia, second place with 28%. Um, some big purchasers do not buy as much from the United States. Venezuela, obviously. Um, Brazil, before Bolsonaro, bought some nuclear subs from the French, uh, fighter aircraft from the Swedes, uh, chose not to buy from the United States. Peru, since a 1968 leftist military coup, has bought a lot of their weapons from the Russians. So it is a bit more of a, a, a mixed picture. Sure. I'm having a severe bout of imposter syndrome right now, but I can, um, I think, I feel safe saying that um, I think it's two different questions for the American public. First of all, as those numbers seem to show, do Americans support selling arms abroad? No. But if somebody were to make this economic argument that, well, it, if 
other countries are going to sell arms, why shouldn't it be the United States? Why shouldn't our industries benefit from that? So I can see them seeing it both sides, both ways. We will open to questions for those who are not here for the first panel. Please just identify yourself. Keep your question to a question and short, and we'll start uh, here in the front row. <clears throat> I'm a Peter Humphrey, an intelligence analyst and a former diplomat. Wondering uh, if we can get ahead of the curve on the uh, tough future horizon in which we're not sending arms, but we're just sending plans to arms to uh, uh, 3D printing machines or stamp metal machines so that a Kalashnikov can be assembled at the receiving end without it ever crossing an ocean. So I wonder if those treaties could anticipate the inevitable here and try and regulate that as well, where you are sending zeros and ones across the ocean and the assembly of the weapon happens in country and never leaves the country. Does anyone want to take that, or would you like me to use the moderator's prerogative? You go first. I haven't looked at this enough in my yeah. So this is actually, this has been a very um, prescient case. Uh, there was a case where there was a, a U.S. citizen who posted online um, the plans for how to make a handgun and um, was smacked down by the U.S. Directorate of Defense Trade Control saying that amounted to an arms export. He not only fought that um, particular decision, but he also tried to sue the individuals who made that decision as private citizens as well. And it became a pretty ugly um, court battle, which um, was settled. The plans have come down. It is a um, controlled item to post plans for uh, producing weapons. It does not mean, however, he was arguing it was a free speech issue. Hmm. It does not mean, however, that there won't be someone else who tries a different way to um, provide that information. But the technical specifications of weapon sales, whether you're posting them online or you're selling them to a, a, a government whose plant exists in that country and they want to manufacture, those are controlled items. Those require licenses in many cases. They require, in some cases, depending on the value, um, other, uh, other oversight. And so it will be, I think, though, as we move to um, more technology being exported in more creative ways, those are going to be things that I think we find um, people pushing. Obviously, once something is online and it lives on the internet forever, um, and so those plans can be. Um, well, I'm thinking that the Arma like company is being contracted send the digits overseas to a closed channel. Those still, because they're technical specifications, do require a munitions list. Yeah. It is a yeah, United States munitions list item that requires um, a license to be able to do that. I don't know if anyone has anything else to add. The only thing I'd say is that for the time being, getting an arm on the black market is so much cheaper uh, than than this new thing uh, until that that the price curves cross uh, that's not a consideration really in Latin America right now we'll go first one of them <laughs> uh, Richard Coleman CBP retired um, can you address any, any thoughts of the uh, much lamented uh, decision by Turkey to buy Russian equipment that's totally uh, uh, incompatible with its status as a NATO member currently. Scott, do you want to take that one? Ask a lot of Americanist to know. Okay. So I'll, I'm thinking I'm going to have to take that one. Um, so, yeah, that's a troubling, well, so there's a lot of issues that really to unpack there. It's not a, well, that's a terrible decision or that's a great decision. It's really, you know, it is much, it's a symbolic decision is what it is, right? It, um, it is very difficult if a country, um, this goes into my, if the US sells it, um, it doesn't sell it, someone else will argument. Um, it's very difficult for a country that has historically bought US weapons to suddenly overnight switch its entire military force to be that of um, Russian origin. It just, that's not how the arms trade works. First of all, it takes a long time to um, negotiate the deals and to, 
uh, you know, make the purchases, but it's also a financial issue where you're not going to replace every single item in your military at once. The problem with the Russian planes is that they're not going to talk to other jets in the in the in Turkey's force, but also with its NATO partners and allies. So it was very symbolic. It really um, politically was sending a signal to the United States about alliances and about who their friends were. Um, I don't think you're going to see a sweeping overhaul of Turkey's military just because financially it makes no sense, because of operations, because of its place in the world. It doesn't make a lot of sense. But it certainly, I think, was um, served its political purpose. It rallied uh, members of Congress that said, we need to be selling more weapons to Turkey. It empowered those that were looking to um, continue an arms race in the region and I think sends a, um, a message to um, many different actors about Turkey's intent and how it sees its role in the world that should not be um, ignored by not just U.S. Um, uh, policymakers, but by its European neighbors as well. And it sent a message, I think, very strongly to them, particularly in sort of the, the Brexit um, debates and discussions about you know, what it is to be European and, and what that looks like. We have a question behind, and then we'll go. Well, let's take two because I think we're running out of time. So if we could then pass over. I'll, I'll be brief then. This is Elias from the Security Assistance Monitor. I'm wondering if the actions of the last few years from the from President Trump or in the past have you noticed uh, U.S. arms trade policy affecting global arms trade policy? I'm thinking particularly from Russia and China. The U.S. clearly dominates. I'm wondering if that gives them greater license to define um, the best practices or the practices that other countries adopt as well. And then let's take this one here in the corner and then we'll answer those and see if we have, I'm conscious of time. Uh, hi, my name is Dara Phillip from the International Technology and Trade Associates. I actually had a similar question regarding whether or not uh, perhaps Trump administration perceptions that China is also attempting to become a major player in global arms sales is impacting decisions to broaden U.S. ability to quickly sell um, arms abroad. Uh, so thank you. Maybe we can answer those from a regional perspective, and then if need be, I can. Yeah, I, don't, I really don't want to be put in a position to answer the Trump administration. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, yeah, I, I'm sorry, I can't uh, offer any insight into that. Um, I don't know much about how the Trump administration's stance may be opening the door to more arms purchases in the region. It's kind of hard to measure in the region right now because of the stagnant economies, too. Official arms transfers are down overall. Governments, are, their defense budgets are not growing right now as, as growth is super sluggish. If there was growth, uh, maybe we would see more, pro, more of a variety of, of purchasers or more of a free-for-all. Uh, but right now, yeah, most of the action is in trafficking, illegal trafficking. Uh, on the China question, one thing we hear from U.S. military and other Trump administration officials is yeah, they're concerned about China selling weapons more cheaply and with fewer strings attached. You know, this is where they sort of subtly complain about those Leahy Law and all those other, or, you know, the slowness of foreign military sales um, cases getting in the way of the Chinese are so much more nimble and able to uh, deliver so much more quickly. Some uh, uh, maybe jealousy, but also maybe some pride that we hold things to a higher standard mixed in. Depends who you ask. Um, also, very common in the uh, rhetoric is that the Chinese weapons are junk, they're lower quality, and they don't come with the same kind of, uh, you know, service packages and maintenance afterward, which is probably true. I think probably an unexpected answer to your question is that we've actually seen some of the U.S. actions resulting in China, particularly, demonstrating how responsible it is really? in the arms trade. And so, with the example of the arms trade treaty, for example, when the U.S. Um, announced that it would be withdrawing its signature, which by the way, you can't actually do, but with withdrawing its signature um, from the ATT, China came out and said, well, we are considering joining the arms trade treaty to demonstrate our commitment to a more responsible and regulated arms trade. You are seeing um, China speak out in some, you know, um, international forums about the changes that it's making to its national export policy to put it in line with some of its Western um, counterparts and, and looking for examples from Western democracies about how they regulate arms. So you're seeing just, again, very symbolically in terms of the question about best practices and, and, um, and actions. I do think that the Trump administration is leading us to, in some ways, an arms race with itself. 
um, but also um, be building up sort of the Russia and China threat as a reason for selling more arms um, more quickly to more countries um, so that it can continue its dominance and that we don't want to have another case of, uh, of a Turkey buying Russian jets um, within sort of our allied circle. So I think it is politically a very useful tool, but it also is um, allowing sort of strange opportunities for particularly China, not so much Russia, to demonstrate its quote unquote responsibility um, in, the, in the arms trade. I think we have time for maybe one, maybe two. If there's any other questions, I'll take them both together. Oh, thank you. Uh, Mitsuo Nakai is my name, uh, Reagan Foundation. I'm more curious about the black market. Uh, can someone comment on that? Uh. Okay, so black market, and we'll take one more question over here. Original question. Can you introduce your? Yeah. Sorry, for Sanders, it's an original question that I think would be America's appropriate, probably not Middle East. Are there any genuinely low risk opportunities for cooperation, security cooperation? There might be a better place for tensions than ideas like you know, changing the small arms policy. Black market. Yeah, what we know about the black market is always changing. The black market in small weapons, um, again, in the northern tier, much of it does involve U.S. gun, as I said, gun dealers and. Um, organized crime networks that are generally tied to Mexican and Central American organized crime, which then have links to states. Venezuela is probably mainly from existing stockpiles. Most of the irregular groups there that are carrying out violence that are pro-government tend to have a historic relationship with the government, the colectivos, the pranes, um, uh, the milicias. Um, so that probably is leaking from the government itself um, with some role perhaps of, of Russian and other intermediaries at times. Um, elsewhere in the Brazilian favelas, for instance, it's more of a mixed bag. Um, a lot of it does actually come from the United States uh, through the same way, through cargo containers, we believe. Um, and other than that, I'm not exactly even sure how else it's getting to Brazil, which countries Any haven't done enough work. from China? <sighs> We do see, in some cases, seizures of Chinese weapons, but it's not as frequent as elsewhere. I think it depends yeah. on the region, right? What region of the world you're in. Yeah, if I'm you're in Latin in, America. Right, yeah. in Latin America, you're going to see more, on the black market, you'll see more U.S. weapons. If you're in the Pacific, you're going to see more um, Chinese origin uh, weapons, and, and, and in Africa as well, just depending on where some of those conduits of trade um, have been. So I think the black market, both for the, the small arms trade, but also what we haven't mentioned at all today is the market for um, parts and components. Um, spare parts tend to be um, sort of the way in which we can control future usage of weapons. So Iran is a great deal, right? So we sold Iran jets, but then we stopped selling them the parts to maintain them. Those happen to be the most trafficked um, items on the black market are the, the spare parts for that. So it depends on sort of what region you're looking at, where, what countries um, that you're looking at, but certainly there is a very robust um, illicit trade that maybe that's a panel for next year, Jeff Abramson, um, to examine uh, the, the impact and the um, roles and responsibilities that contribute to, to the black market trade. Last question was on uh, security cooperation with, I think would, that's actually a question that would be appropriate for both the Americas, but also for um, Saudi Arabia and the Middle East, right? That's a region of the world where we've said we have to sell these weapons because the cooperation and the alliances that we've developed help us counter these very dangerous threats um, in the region. Do those sort of hold water? What are the opportunities there? Selling, uh, selling an aerial uh, munition to Saudi Arabia is a very different proposition than selling um, uh, naval assets, for example. Um, I'm not enough. Uh, I'm, I'm not deep enough in analysis to say um, what what the various risks are for each weapon system. But it's, I think it. I think um, a lot of people do, uh, particularly on the Hill, get into a bit of a trap when they think this is a good actor who we can sell to, or this is a bad actor who we can't sell to. Um, it's a bit more granular. 
there might be some things that are actual um, security needs or that will not be used to perpetuate a particularly deadly civilian uh, war um, versus those that are actually contributing to um, you know, U.S. operations or counterterrorism operations in the region. Yeah, in Latin America, the question would be security cooperation against what? Um, against, I mean, there really aren't a lot of scenarios of external threats. Uh, interstate wars are super rare. Let's hope it stays that way this year. Um, but yeah, so security cooperation then would probably be against transnational organized crime, which has great, you know, expansive networks that cross borders. That would require two things, I think. First, an incredible anti-corruption effort that we do not see uh, involving well-protected people and justice systems that are actually rooting out the corruption that organized crime lives off of in all of these countries. Otherwise, there will be no trust in any cooperative agreement because you don't necessarily know who you're working with with another country's force. Um, and the second is just overall security sector reform but in general throughout the region. You have police forces that are very dysfunctional, justice systems that, can, you know, you have impunity rates for homicides well in excess of 90 percent in many countries. Uh, if that's your main security threat, then you don't fight it just with the military. You've got to fight it with a whole panoply of institutions. Which, by the way, if I can add yeah. on, just on the tail end, um, in some countries is also a uh, driver of the black market, is improperly sequenced security sector assistance. That's a good way to put right? it. Yeah. So yeah. Um, Somalia is a great example. Countries are awash in guns. Um, what does the government want? Military hardware. What does the government need? Salaries for soldiers. Yeah. Health care for soldiers. So when they get guns, and when they need health care, what are they going to do? They're going to sell guns on the black market to pay for health care. Wow. On that happy wow. note, <laughs> um, I think this conversation could continue, but we have more excitement ahead for you. We Just staging-wise, we have to switch the mics, so we're going to take a very short, and when I say short, I'm emphasizing short, so come back and sit in your seats. But there are some snacks out there for you to have, and I know you all want to speak with our panelists, uh, which you can do not only in the break, but at at the reception afterwards, so I encourage you to stay for the rest of the day and enjoy some stimulating conversation. Thank you very much Thank to my you. panelists. Good Thanks to all Good of question. you. All right. Thanks, everybody, for sticking it out, out to continue with the panels today. We have a great one coming up ahead of you. I used to be a classroom teacher, and I always sort of worried about the people coming back after the snack and whether, you know, the food coma. I think we did have a high sugar content in our, in our desserts, but I hope you're energized by that and, and not hitting food coma. Um, we've had a great, uh, you know, keynote from... Representative Liu, and then that first panel, which really sort of dug into the behind the headlines and some deep thought on a wide array of issues. And it, you could tell by the questions that there's still so much more to talk about. And we didn't just want to uncover uh, what these issues are, the arms trade behind the headlines. We wanted to start thinking about what some of the recommendations would be moving forward. So this panel is really geared towards, OK, now that we've fleshed out some of these issues, what are some things that can actually be done? Because there is a wide range of of ways to move forward. Some of it is, is actually to do what we're supposed to be doing, which is already part of the law, but some of it is actually changes to processes. Um, and so we have a great set of panels. I, I don't think, uh, I'll get to make closing remarks at the end, but I don't think you can realize how great it is to be sort of part of this professional network in the forum. All of the panelists up here are also experts that are part of the forum, two of which are actually on the steering committee, Kate and Dan. And it's, it's really great. We're hitting into our fifth year now, or just actually finishing five years. Um, and it's, it's uh, to be able to pull together our disparate expertises to really start talking about these issues in ways that we hope will give you ideas for moving forward is, is a great opportunity. And I'm humbled to be here with all of them. I'm going to quickly introduce them, and then we're going to go uh, let them speak. I'll say a little bit uh, on another topic, and then we want to do, we really do want to open this up for questions. Uh, I am, I don't know if I said who I am. I'm Jeff Abramson. I'm a senior fellow at the Arms Control Association and uh, also direct the forum. To my right is Kate Kaiser, who is policy director 
at Win Without War, who is going to kick us off with sort of some big picture framing for how we can start thinking about what first principles will be as we talk about a more responsible arms trade. Uh, she has a great background also in, ex in issues in the Middle East, and uh, we've covered that a great deal, but I think you'll see her draw upon some of those as well. But we have had a great conversation so far, especially around the, the war in Yemen and uh, arms sales to Saudi and its allies. To my left after that, after that is Diana Olbaum, who has a longer title, so I have to look it up, sorry. Senior Strategist and Legislative Director for Foreign Policy at the Friends Committee on National Legislation, uh, where she directs their foreign policy work, but also has a, a very extensive background working on uh, both houses of Congress and a wide array of issues around the Foreign Assistance Act and other issues. Um, and she will be talking about some of the things that can be done at the congressional level. Dan Mahanty, who introduced himself late at the beginning, or uh, at the end of the keynote address, is the uh, director of the U.S. program at the Center for Civilians in Conflict, uh, where he does a great deal of work around a number of issues, uh, but also was in the administration for many of years, also looking very closely at the uh, human rights angles in the arms trade and had some insights into how many of those decisions were made, and will share some insights into what could be done at the executive branch. If you haven't seen any of their writings, they're all writing extensively uh, on these issues. Um, so that you, there's some references that they may have for you to read later as well. Uh, we didn't fill the materials table outside, but um, there's a lot out there that we can draw on for this. But we do want to open it up for questions. But I will first turn it over to Kate to help us sort of think about uh, this is a big picture, how we can think about how this resonates, what the, what the principles should be that we turn to, and then we'll go to some of the, the other specific suggestions. Thanks, Jeff. Um, everyone hear me okay? Great. Um, so I'm going to just kind of talk through what a reframing of U.S. responsibility in the arms trade might look like if we're actually thinking about doing a total rethink of U.S. arms trade. Um, as many of you, all of you know, I would suspect watching this event, um, the U.S. is the largest arms exporter in the entire world. And it's my opinion that that actually helps fuel a lot of violence around the world and has further militarized U.S. foreign policy over the last several decades. And so the effect of that is that we are investing in these tools of military assistance, weapon sales, and really under-investing in other tools of statecraft like the State Department, like USAID, like local peace-building initiatives that are actually not... In, as a result, not allowing U.S. foreign policy to achieve the goals it says it wants to achieve. So I think one of the things to start with is when we think about the arms trade or what U.S. policy goals are via selling weapons, what are we trying to achieve? One of the things that's always talked about is particularly in the notifications to Congress when the State Department decides to authorize a sale, is that this is a key national security tool that the United States is using to build security and stability in whatever region of the world these weapons are going to. Now, it's a largely uninterrogated premise that these are a key national security tool. Um, some of the goals that are talked about is that they build safety, they build stability. Um, and then the third kind of primary goal is interoperability with foreign militaries around the world. And I would say that there's pretty ample academic evidence that selling weapons to countries that commit human rights abuses, um, that have uh, schemes of grand corruption within their governments or militaries doesn't actually build safety or stability. And I think part of this is a result of the U.S. government not actually trying to define what stability actually means. And so if we're trying to achieve stability, we first have to know what we're trying to achieve. Um, and the lessons of Afghanistan and Iraq show that we're not actually good at it and military tools don't achieve um, things that are much more rooted in democratic governance and economic opportunity. Um, and in terms of interoperability, it's a good goal if the goal is really to have a superfluous military partnerships around the world. But what are those partnerships for? Is it so we can wage more wars? Is it so we can actually use military might as kind of the first tool of order to increase stability or achieve safety? And I think we have, you know, 20 years of evidence at this point that maybe that doesn't actually work. Uh, maybe that actually... Uh, increases in stability and conflict in various parts of the world where we have tried that um, in waging these endless wars since 9-11. And I think the other thing we should be discussing 
is what does the United States government say it wants to be, theoretically? There's not necessarily in this administration, but previously, um, under both Democratic and Republican administrations, there's always the line trotted out that the U.S. Is, wants to be a force for good in the world. Um, even in Secretary Pompeo's latest statement about its decision not to withdraw U.S. troops from Iraq, it states rather laughably at this point that the U.S. is a force for good in the Middle East. And so when we are selling weapons to countries that commit human rights abuses um, or turn these weapons that we sell them on protesters who are asking for freedom of speech um, or accountable governance, is that really a force for good? If we're continuing to sell those weapons in the case of Bahrain or Saudi Arabia um, or Egypt where there's no accountability for those types of actions and we continue giving weapons and security assistance, what is the good that's being produced from that? If anything, it's often just re-entrenching these regimes' power um, or entrenching the power of the military in these countries, which is creating an imbalance within the society where the military then becomes the most powerful institution versus the political or economic institutions in that country, which will ultimately lead to instability in the long term. And then I think the other thing that we often say, as I mentioned, is we support human rights. We are the leader of the free world. But in, in essence, what a lot of these weapons sales do is just re-entrench these same authoritarian systems that actually prevent the um, expression and realization of human rights around the world. And so if we actually want to meet these things that our government says we want to meet them, we actually have to rethink how we're doing weapon sales. Um, and three principles come to mind um, when we're thinking about redefining what responsibility looks like. The first principle is do no harm. Um, if the U.S. actually wants to be a force for good in the world, if we actually want to support democratic human rights movements around the world in a consistent way, then we should be thinking about whether or not sending weapons to a foreign government will actually do more harm than good. In a lot of cases, it actually does more harm than good. We have recent case studies in Yemen, in Somalia, where you have this mentality of if we just build up this foreign military just enough, then human rights and democratic governance and all these things will follow. But we have years of history and evidence that that actually doesn't often happen. The second principle is that we should first and foremost enforce the laws and regulations that we already have on the books when it comes to human rights. Um, so Diana, I'm sure, will talk about the Foreign Assistance Act um, of 1961 that actually put in a lot of good human rights enforcement mechanisms that, if they were fully enforced today, would cut off a large stream of weapon sales that we are currently selling to different countries. Um, and we should go further. There is being legislation being talked about right now that would create higher red lines um, that would require countries to meet certain right, uh, requirements on human rights, on corruption, on um, the way they wage conflicts or their involvement in conflicts. And those should all be part of the conversation when we're deciding whether or not we should be selling these weapons. Um, and if we do that, even if we just started with enforcing existing laws, that would also put us in a better place of setting inter higher international standards to allow other countries to follow our lead. And then the third principle that comes to mind is if we're going to stop worrying about the bottom line of arms weapons companies or defense contractors and all of this, what we should be doing is we should be taking money from the Pentagon that is severely bloated that is unaccountable, has never passed an audit, almost 50% of that budget goes to defense manufacturers, and we should be reinvesting in other tools that can actually achieve the goals that we want. We should be investing in the United Nations. We should be investing in a department of peace building that could actually help local actors around the world find local solutions to conflict and prevent conflict in the long term. And so these are just some of uh, the ideas that we could uh, be investing in if we're actually taking a step back and kind of rethinking what the goals are and then actually putting into action steps that would achieve them. Thanks so much, Kate. And I, I think it's always helpful for us to, to start back on these first principles because these are always, you know, if, as we look at the history of the development of the arms trade, we, we revisit these, but we often forget them. And when we get into the minutiae, we, we don't remind ourselves that some of these 
we've said we want to do and we're not living up to them. So that'll help frame the conversation as we move forward. I think we're going to ask Dan to go next. No? Diana, Diana to go. Oh, I thought we just agreed the other way. All right. No. Uh, Diana to go next to, to talk about, I think, Congress, particularly yes. what some of the options might be. And now we, we are going to get into the weeds. We're not bashful about getting into the weeds, but we'll try to keep it at a level also that we can have some great conversation as well. But Diana, well, thank, thank you. you. I'll try not to get too horribly into the weeds. Um, and at the risk of um, repeating a lot of what Kate just said and maybe what you've heard earlier in the day, I just wanted to talk about like the three main problems with our current arms sale regime that I think we need to talk about fixing. The first is the basic problem that the United States is either selling or enabling the sale of arms that are likely to be misused, either to conduct aggression, violate human rights, escalate regional arms races and instability, fuel corruption, uh, or transfer to third parties. And the financial and sometimes diplomatic pressure to continue these sales, even knowing that they may contribute to these problems, um, is so great that we sometimes turn a blind eye to these risks. The second problem is that such sales make the United States directly complicit in the abuses and harms that result. Um, this causes enormous damage to our national reputation and our national security. For instance, when U.S. made bombs fall on a school bus or a hospital in Yemen, um, there's no way for us to avoid responsibility for that, either morally or politically. And the third part of that problem is that Congress is almost entirely unable to stop even the most egregiously wrongheaded sales. There has never been a case where Congress legislatively prohibited an arms sale that the administration wanted to go ahead with. There's certainly been cases where um, pressure from Congress led the administration to voluntarily change or abandon a sale, but there's never been a case at which um, Congress overruled um, a veto. So there, while most of these problems, I think, could be solved by an administration that took its responsibility to do no harm seriously, I think it's a fool's errand to wait for that, such an administration to uh, materialize. Uh, many people had placed their hopes in the Obama administration that they would impose some real controls on arms control and on the arms industry, and um, only to discover that Obama really would, took just as mercenary an approach as the previous administrations. Therefore, I do think it's time for a Congress to step up to the plate under pressure from the American people to fix the system. And if Congress wanted to act, here are some simple steps that they could take. And I understand that Ted Lieu was looking for some. Um, I probably have 15 more I could add to these, but I won't bore you to death. So the first is flip the script. So under the current system, arms sales go through unless they are disapproved by Congress. And Congress has the ability to change that system so that the sales do not go through unless they are affirmatively approved by Congress. Now, of course, um, there's a lot of sales, and that would require a lot of votes. So you could still even pick out a subset of the most, um, the, the most likely to cause damage sales, beca either because of the countries involved or because of the nature of the equipment or the amount of equipment, and only apply the new rules to that. And even um, if you only did it for that subset, it would be an enormous improvement over the current system. The second thing, which um, Kate sort of alluded to, was to define sales as assistance. If um, you defined all security cooperation and arms sales as foreign assistance under the Foreign Assistance Act of 1961, as we tried to do in our last attempt at foreign aid reform, uh, we would make all the laws that apply to restricting aids to gov aid to governments that do things like um, uh, abuse human rights, engage in human trafficking, recruit child soldiers, and so forth, all those same laws would then apply to arms sales. The third is um, an idea that I've been thinking about a lot, which is to conduct risk assessments. So just like we do environmental impact statements when you do an aid project or a construction project anywhere, Congress could require that every arms sale notice be accompanied by a written assessment uh, of the risks that the sale would 
pose in terms of contributing to instability, corruption, aggression, arms races, unauthorized transfers, violations of human rights, violations of international humanitarian law, and, and force the administration to go through this thought process before they send it up. And the fourth suggestion I have is um, improving the oversight of weapons transfers um, by basically keeping uh, uh, firearms and 3D printing technology on the, um, on the U.S. munitions list, which is overseen by the State Department, rather than allowing them to be transferred to the control of the Commerce Department. Um, now, of course, all of that is a lot easier said than done. Uh, it's not that technically difficult to write any of these uh, laws or establish these procedures. It's that there's a lack of political will. And there's a lack of political will for a number of reasons. The first, uh, let's, let's be open about it, arms industry lobbying. The weapons manufacturers are far more powerful than the human rights community or the peace movement. They donate huge sums to political campaigns. They hire high-powered lobbyists, unlike me and the poor <laughs> peace lobbyists. Um, and they divide up their manufacturing process uh, into almost every congressional district across the country so that they can make a jobs argument. The second is congressional weakness. Uh, the basic problem is that Congress sees little advantage in taking responsibility for decisions. It's far easier for them, and politically they see it as advantageous, to let the executive branch make the decision, which they are then free to criticize or claim credit for, even though they may have had nothing to do with it. And the third is really public apathy. Now, it is really hard to get voters excited and motivated around these issues because they're complicated, they're arcane, and there are tons of other issues that hit you know, closer to home. But even so, uh, a recent poll by the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, which you probably heard about earlier, found that 70% of Americans believe that selling weapons to other countries makes the United States less safe. And that view cut across partisan lines. Even 62% of Republicans thought that. So we do have public opinion on our side. We probably don't have a motivated and activated public opinion on our side. So I don't want to leave us feeling, you know, um, as we often do in this world, like, oh my god, nothing's ever going to change. Um, I do think that change is possible and that it is coming. And here are the two things that keep me hopeful. The first is the experience of what we've just seen with Iran and Yemen. Like two years ago, we would never have imagined that Congress would be stepping up to the plate like this, taking these hard votes, and we're winning again and again in the House, even a few times in the Senate. Yes, it got vetoed by the President, but they're, you know, they're, they're exercising their muscles, they're learning how to take control, and they're feeling the pressure to do so. Um, and the second is demographics. Um, as we are seeing from the popularity of figures like Bernie Sanders, the younger generation is not going to silently acquiesce uh, in the assumption that the U.S. must exert global military domination. They see a world that is literally burning up. Uh, they see raging inequality and injustice, and they see that our current approach to national security is not working, is not making us safer. So it may not be in 2020, I hope it will be, but sooner or later we're going to start changing course and I want to thank all of you out there who work on these issues from day to for day, to day um, for helping us get there and remind you in the light of the holiday um, next Monday of Martin Luther King's quote that the arc of the moral universe is long but it bends toward justice. Wow. <laughs> there you go. You're Be making back. it hard on Dan to go next. <laughs> thanks, thanks a bunch, Diana. I, 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 you know, we need to transcribe that portion of this and, and send it up to the Hill afterwards because I think uh, <laughs> some great ideas are there. So arms sales decisions obviously aren't only made by Congress, but the executive branch is, as Diana says, been taking the lead, especially since Congress is letting them in so many cases. So love to hear your ideas, Dan, on, on sort of ways we can also improve the responsibility of arms trade in that area. Yeah. Um, not only is it hard to go after Diana, but I just want to tell you all to imagine 
you know, imagine the sheer panic and fright that's going through my brain right now, having to basically go after Kate and Diana <laughs> uh, and create <laughs> any new insights or offer any new content uh, that won't come across as uh, mansplaining things they've already said so eloquently, but I will try my best. <laughs> um, I am going to riff off of this, uh, this theme of optimism, though, as I described for you why I think um, there might be some hope and opportunity, um, even from the executive branch, and maybe for some reasons um, that we might not appreciate that have less to do with technical implementation measures that are available to a new president or even the current president, and more to do with kind of the philosophical approach that, that Kate helped to frame. Uh, and why that actually might be um, helpful to uh, a president. Um, I want to start with a small, a short story. I remember, um, first of all, I didn't work for the administration. I worked in the executive branch. And I think for those of us who worked uh, in the executive branch, there's a big difference as I worked and enabled the te terrible policies of not one but three presidents of both parties. Um, so I remember sitting at my desk, um, and I was clearing on a speech. This is what you do when you're a civil servant at the State Department. You you manipulate words on a piece of paper that somehow ends up having tremendous consequences for people all over the world. And this was a speech that was going to be given by uh, somebody from uh, another bureau in the State Department at the time when we were um, kind of evangelizing the benefits of export control reform, the process by which we, the U.S. government was looking at changing uh, arms export regulations. Uh, people like Brittany Benowitz in the audience have written a lot on this. And the first line to this trade industry group was, U.S. arms sales are an act of foreign policy. And as I reflect on that now, it occurs to me that that statement is a Rorschach test for the people who deal with the arms trade. For the people that were the intended target audience of that particular speech, the idea was to give all of the fuel possible to all of the reasons why we you know, too infrequently critically appraise all the benefits that arms sales are supposed to have, the benefits that you guys have talked about, the benefits to industry, the benefits to security, and so forth. Whereas at the same time, if you were to ask this group of people, I think many of us in this room, we would say, yes, arms sales are an act of foreign policy, and for a lot of the reasons why that's a bad thing. Uh, and not only would we say arms sales are an act of foreign policy, but we would, I would argue that arms sales have become a major and prominent part of the story of U.S. foreign policy to a lot of the people who aren't involved in actually formulating foreign policy. Too many people around the world these days either perceive or experience the United States of America because of the arms that we export abroad. We dominate the market with 30%, so it's a barely rivaled statistic uh, in most years. And so, yes, it is an act of foreign policy. And for a president that's coming into the White House to say, okay, if this is a policy issue, not just a technical issue, how might I think about the fact that our foreign policy objectives, much to Kate's point, are being inhibited by our, our lack of critical appraisal of all the things that we say arms sales do? Because if you think about it, it's actually an encumbrance on the President of the United States to come in and be told, look, you've got all these constituencies and these, uh, you know, these special interests who are making these claims about the benefits of something that is costing you in terms of perception, resource allocation, and the faith and trust that people around the world place in the government. And to me, as the President of the United States, I say, well, how do I unencumber myself from these claims? And I think any president, current president included, could start by saying, okay, one, we're going to take this out of the bureaucratic depths of the State Department and the Pentagon. We're going to recognize the weight with that this carries in the execution of foreign policy and the fact that it has become the easy button. I think someone was referring to, to Laura Lumpe's statement that it's basically become the, uh, the, the candy that ambassadors can hand out. It's the, it's the currency of American diplomacy at this point. So we're going to recognize this as a policy issue, and then we're going to one by one critically assess all of these claims. None of the special interests that are making these claims were terribly beholden to as much as people think. So let's look at those. And if we did that, let's think about what foreign policy might look like unencumbered from those claims. What might we assess? Um, do arms sales actually make the United States of America safer at the end of the day? Do they contribute to a more stable international system? Do they actually increase jobs, something that Bill Hartung has run, uh, written about? Do they improve the human rights conduct of our partners, an unevaluated claim that people make a lot? Does American dominance the arms trade market actually work to balance against our supposed peers? And if, even if they do, is there a good reason to be balancing against those peers in that way? Those are all the stated benefits of arms sales. If you look at um, public proclamations from the executive branch of government, even within Congress, those are typically the rhetorical bases upon which we were uh, justifying this massive piece of our foreign uh, policy. So you could say, if you 
you unmask some of those and critically assess them, much like my colleague Annie Shielded in a remarkable op-ed for The Hill that came out on Christmas Eve, so you might have missed it, but we'll circulate it later. If you did re critically appraise those things and you found out that some of them were not true, on the one hand, you could say, well, those are some inconvenient truths that are really politically provocative. Or you could say, wow, this is a way for Gulliver or Gulliver's female equivalent, just want to make sure I'm gender balanced, mm -hmm. <laughs> can actually cut the strings that bind her to the beach. And you could actually execute a foreign policy that is based on an affirmative vision for what bilateral and multilateral diplomacy could and should look like. Imagine the freedom that that would uh, impart. Now, I'll talk a little bit about the technical side, only because I think that's the only reason I was actually invited here. <laughs> <laughs> what might this look like? And you do see, in, in, in fairness to the executive branch, you do see trappings of this already in place and already starting to be implemented. Because I think there is a, a consensus, largely driven by frustrated bureaucrats and frustrated staff on, on the Hill, that says we do need better risk assessments. We do need stronger end use controls. We do need greater transparency. And so I do think we're seeing some initiatives in those arenas that shouldn't be uh, overlooked. But here's some principal approach on the technical side. Number one, I see no reason at all why arms sales decisions shouldn't be based on a much more selective methodology. Yes, risk assessments are really important. I think that's a part of the technical approach. But I think selectivity is really the operative principle here. It is picking the partners with whom we can be most assured that all of those claims are guaranteed to actually be executed with fidelity, and fewer that don't. Because I would argue for most of American arms sales, um, we could actually survive, American industry could survive, American businesses, by the way, that do not depend on exports to maintain their, their business viability uh, would survive a, a much more selective approach. In fact, in Annie's article, she points out the fact that 71% of conventional arms transfers that we know about already, already go to countries that Freedom House assesses it free. So that leaves 29% of the market to deal with, um, which could be problematic, but it does lend some fuel, I think, to this idea that we could be uh, much more selective of a, as a first principle. Um, on the issue of assessments, though, I, I really love this idea. It's something that's in our report. I think other reports have, have gone into this. Um, I was really excited to see in the Global Fragility Act final language that came out in the Appropriations Act, uh, the inclusion of language. I don't know who we have to thank for this. I'm guessing it's mm -hmm. someone in this room. Um, that requires an assessment um, of the risk introduced by, by security cooperation. And in my mind, security cooperation implicates uh, arms sales. Um, so that's promising and creates some opportunity for reform. In that, um, in that arena. Um, we've talked about it now twice in this panel and previous panels. Um, we've got to get a handle on small arms uh, through trafficking and through the formal export system. Uh, there is no reason why America's pathological issue with small arms needs to be exported uh, to the violent circumstances of other countries. Um, so an executive branch needs to get a, a handle on that. Arms sales agreements um, are a great tool, right? They are diplomatic leverage. And for an administration that loves the leverage in, in trade negotiations, as this one does, you would imagine that they would want to strengthen their hand by having the rule of law at their disposal in the event that arms were used in a way that they hadn't intended. Um, I think there's still opportunity to strengthen agreements uh, when arms actually change hands. Uh, and there are a number of ways that actually that can take place that would you know, require returning to uh, to storage in the event of misuse, requiring the ability to access and oversee arms uh, and the way that they're being applied, um, and so on. We've talked a lot of, in past discussions about uh, end-use monitoring. Um, there are literally now reports being written just about this. Um, it's a key issue that, in large part, I think, because of some bureaucratic and resource constraints, but also because of some of the political impediments we described, um, the United States government just doesn't have a handle on what happens to the weapons once um, they're, they're actually delivered. Um, even conceding resource constraints, um, that to me seems uh, unacceptable. Um, arms sales have got to be, the entire process has to be more transparent. You alluded to it. Um, I see no benefit to a, a, um, an opaque system wherein highly lethal capabilities are being transferred uh, with very little public appraisal and critique, uh, um, let alone the voice and how those things are taking place. Um, and so there are a range of other, I guess, technical things we can elaborate on. I just want to put everybody uh, who's not already asleep to sleep. Um, and I did, like I said, I wanted to riff on the optimism here because I, I'm probably like a Pollyanna, uh, but I do think based on the, the perceptions, uh, the, the pulse that we've gotten from certain uh, quarters of Congress for kind of bipartisan support for greater congressional oversight, 
Um, the civil servants who are actually already in these these buildings who actually want they don't want um, you know American arms to be um, used in this way. Uh, and I think based on the, the discussion we had this morning about polling, um, I'm more optimistic than ever, um, especially with this current field of candidates as well that could commit to this, that, that we can make some real fundamental change to adhere more closely to the first principles that, that Kate laid out. So, inshallah. Was <laughs> <laughs> I supposed to turn on my microphone for that? Yeah, you were supposed to turn on your microphone. <laughs> <laughs> Turn it on now that you're Damn, done. I you well, I hope, you, I, I hope you write that down, Dan, because we were going to, it's hard to transcribe now. But, um, uh, wow, so I hope other people wrote down. We have lots of great ideas now surfacing um, here. Uh, I want to quickly, before I turn it over to conversation, because we definitely, there's other ideas and we want to, you know, hear your thoughts on what we're saying. I wanted to just mention, there's one more thing going on this year, obviously. There's an election. And one of the things that the Forum on the Arms Trade is doing is trying to track arms trade issues in the, in the candidates. We uh, had to remove one yesterday, Owen, uh, Owen who's been the lead on this. We, we joke like whether, what the numbers are going to be. And I think it, when we got to 22, we thought it was going to stop. And then two more people came in. And so it's, we've been tracking. I think we're down to 15 candidates running for president right now and, and their positions. And I think uh, if you've seen some of my writings lately, I really do think that the presidential election is going to provide a moment for Democrats and Republicans to distinguish themselves on how they think about the arms trade. And I think um, we are tracking particularly three issues right now, and we'll track more as people have suggestions. And when the field gets winnowed, it'll be a little bit early, easier. But there is a flyer out there where we try to give you a little teaser of what the charts and other things we're looking at we have. Uh, the three different issues and where people stand. Then we have sort of details about that by issue. And then we have a page on each candidate on where they are at. Uh, right now, I see this bifurcation developing, obviously, around arms sales to Saudi Arabia. I think we see almost all the Democratic candidates at this point being very skeptical. And that's a way that they can distinguish themselves from the Trump administration. Uh, this issue that a number of us are flagging, I'm very uh, Sad to report that I expect probably later this week the Trump administration will decide to go ahead with changing uh, the way firearms are exported um, by publishing rules that they put out to Congress in November that Senator Mendez asked to hold on, but the administration is not obliged to, to keep. So I think this is going to drive uh, an interesting domestic issue, which is the use and sale of assault weapons now becoming easier internationally. I think you'll see more candidates and more of the domestic constituency making this link between domestic and international, which a number of us are doing. Thus far, we've only tracked uh, two candidates who have come out opposed to the way the Trump administration moves to move, move forward. But given that all of them support an assault weapons ban, you might see this become an issue of bifurcation between. The, uh, I assume Trump is going to win the Republican nomination. It's not necessarily, but you know, the Trump approach and, and a Democratic approach. And then the third issue we're tracking, which has surfaced at times, is the arms trade treaty, which the Trump administration, as Rachel said, wanted to unsign last year. We have three candidates who we tracked who said, oh, I support the arms trade treaty. I'd like to move back on that. And a number of them have said almost those same words without saying the arms trade treaty. So I think this is another issue that you might see a difference. And as this election cycle goes on, the more attention I think that these issues create, uh, the more awareness and the more we have opportunities for the public to engage. And as the polling suggests, if it's framed the right way, they do get it. Uh, and I think that that is, I will end on a little bit of optimism before we take the questions as well. Uh, that's a, another piece of what's moving forward in this year. As we take questions, I'll ask all of our panelists, you know, obviously it's a difficult political environment. It's difficult to change what's happening in the executive branch as well. But uh, you've talked about your optimism, I think also just sort of like the realism of how to move some of this stuff forward as well will be great. But I'd like to turn it over now for a couple for questions. I'll take two to start with, and then we'll return to the room for some more. Uh, wait, wait for the mic, Alex. Sorry. And make sure the green light's on. Put it on the mic. Okay. Testing. Okay. okay. Eric Woods, okay. Georgetown University. Sometimes the United States is forced to work with unreliable, less reliable partners. I'm thinking specifically of some militias and other armed groups in Iraq and Afghanistan against extremist groups. Uh, and oftentimes, these arms can easily be found diverted. How does the US balance its need to cooperate with um, 
not always the most reliable partners with actually achieving its security objectives. Thank you. Can we get a second? To... We stumped them with all our great ideas. Oh, Paul over here. Thank you. Uh, Paul Walker, I'm vice chair of the board of the Arms Control Association. Um, I used to work on this issue very closely some years ago, some decades ago, actually, on Capitol Hill. <clears throat> and maybe the, this should be primarily to you, Diana, but what you really need with all these very good suggestions and initiatives, uh, risk assessments and greater transparency and more oversight and selective you know, decision making on which weapon sales are, are okay and which aren't, <clears throat> is really champions on Capitol Hill. And I'm wondering, we know Ted Lieu, Ed Maki, maybe a few others are, are very good champions and we, sh we all should work with them closely, I think, and continue to uh, press the case with them. But who else today on Capitol Hill? I mean, previously we had, I'll mention some older names that some of you may not recognize, but Pat Schroeder, uh, Ron Dellums, uh, a wide variety, really, even John Spratt from South Carolina, some really good people on Capitol Hill uh, who were very concerned over weapon sales uh, back in the 70s, 80s, even the 90s. Uh, I just don't see the the uh, the champions today, not not just on weapon sales and questions about weapon sales, but really on limiting uh, the military budget. Uh, anyone talks about, it's like the third rail these days, and you talk about cutting the military budget or, or just raising questions about the viability of such an enormous military budget every year, and it, 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 uh, it's very difficult, just as it was in the you know, in the 60s and the 70s. Um, so I'd like anyone to answer that, but but certainly Diana working the Hill the way you do on FCNL, uh, I'd like your advice on that. Thanks. Great, thank you, Paul. So I think a, a great two set of questions to kick us off, this really tough, you know, dilemma that Eric is, is raising for us, and then Paul's question around uh, congressional leadership, which I think, I think we're gonna have more for you than you think, but who wants to start off, and I think we all can talk on both, but Kate, yeah. Um, so great questions. So on the first question, I actually think it's not as tough of a dilemma <laughs> um, as many might think it is or how it is actually thought about within the government. Um, and I think I would go back to kind of the premise of your question of like the U.S. has this need to cooperate with maybe less savory non-state actors to achieve its national security goals. First of all, is that cooperation actually achieving those national security goals? If we look at the U.S. fight against ISIS, we primarily relied on, on arming either non-state actors or working with the Iraqi military to clear areas, um, as well as airstrikes. But the effect of those clear and build operations have largely not been to bring back stability, sustainable peace, um, or even like access to regular services um, to a lot of the areas that have now been cleared of ISIS um, fighters. And so the, my question is, is are we actually achieving the goals we're saying we're achieving or should we be questioning whether security cooperation and military force can actually undermine the influence of groups like ISIS who rely on local grievances that are often rooted in political and economic instability. And I think the evidence from the last 20 years of trying to fight um, what is essentially, we can call it extremism, but it's we are trying to basically address a political problem through the use of military force, and it does not work. Um, and I think we should be real about that. I think we have so many years of evidence at this point that if we don't start to do a rethink now, we're just going to try to apply the same tools in different ways and get the same result. And in the process, fuel instability and violence. And it, we know there's plenty of data on what actually works. It's peace building. It is actually empowering local actors through things like community foundations to fund the local solutions that are needed to actually prevent and mitigate conflict in real time and have a long-term lens on what U.S. national security priorities are. We have to get out of this kind of exchange or focus on short-term results without thinking about the long-term consequences of our actions. And I think, you know, a really useful antidote for this question is there's a story about when 
President Obama drew his red line in Syria. He asked the interagency to come up with a set of options of what they should do. And, you know, there was obviously airstrikes, regime change, all of these things. Um, and one of them was, oh, we can arm the rebels um, and fund them to create instability within the regime and ultimately have political transformation in Syria. And so the Obama administration asked the CIA to do a, a assessment of U.S. actions to do this historically, whether or not it worked. And the CIA came back and said, no, it doesn't work. And the Obama administration still continued to do it. And so I think what that was a result of is not because they were going to ignore necessarily this evidence that it doesn't work or Obama wasn't, you know, reading his daily briefings like someone who currently occupies the White House. But what was happening is that there was such political pressure to do something in the face of instability and violence that he felt he had to do something. But the reality is, is because we weren't investing in these other tools that could actually bring peace and stability and accountability to egregious conflicts like Syria in the long term, he didn't have that option to fall back on. And that's where we have to get Congress to really understand the effects of the tools we're using and the real alternatives that already exist and just need investment. I'd, I'd really like to underline what Kate said there. I mean, this idea that we are forced to work with unreliable partners assumes that we have to be in this forever war. And I encourage people to recognize, as has become, I think, you know, completely obvious, that you cannot end terrorism by killing all the terrorists. That's not how it's going to happen. And it's time for our country to come up with a policy of how to deal with violent extremism and terrorism that is not a war. And that's on us. We have to lead the way. We have to put forward a reasonable alternative to the current approach. And, and, and that's the way out of this. Um, in terms of our congressional uh, you know, champions, we do have a bunch. We really do. We have Ro Khanna. Um, Jim McGovern, Barbara Lee, Tom Malinowski, um, even Adam Smith has been quite helpful in the House on a bunch of things, Chris Murphy in the Senate. And I will say that both Menendez and Engel, you know, the, the chair of the House Foreign Affairs Committee and the ranking member of Senate Foreign Relations, have been really helpful with a lot of the things we're trying to do. So, um, you know, you can always get people more active and to take a, a bigger role. But um, I, I think our main problem in this particular issue isn't so much the lack of champions as the lack of followers. Um, the, the issue of cutting the military budget is, is a, a little bit different and is um, particularly painful to me because that's what I came to Washington to do 35 years ago. And I feel like um, not only have we not made any progress, it's gotten worse. And all the arguments that we've tried, waste, fraud, and abuse, that it's taking money away from things that are better, um, just like they haven't landed and they haven't changed the situation because ultimately, and that's what it ties into all of this, when people feel unsafe, they're willing to spend whatever it costs. And they think that they're buying themselves security. So until we're able to convince people that more money, more military is not going to make them more safe, I think we're trapped into ever-increasing military budgets. Not a Sorry. Lot. No, no, no. <laughs> well, I don't know why. <laughs> uh, not a lot to What? Oh, let me turn on my mic. Hold on. <laughs> Wait for Dan. <laughs> the dim one. <laughs> um, not a lot to add here, but I will say the challenge before, let's, let me put it back in the frame of the challenge before um, a presidential candidate, for example, in the way that kind of Jeff framed this one. Um, it's kind of easy to talk about ending the endless war and broad rhetorical kind of um, flourishes. It's another thing entirely to decondition the American political establishment from a very unhealthy relationship with war. And after 18 years of, of fighting, the idea that somehow we can execute on national security objectives through these like 
highly attenuated means, the, the kind of remote warfare, the training and equip programs, partnered operations and so forth. The principle of, you know, they have local ownership of their own security problems, I think is often offered as a thinly veiled excuse for the fact that we just aren't invested enough in the security problem to put our own people at risk to deal with it. Um, and that's going to be a really hard political challenge for the next administration. The second thing I think, um, I won't use the term deep state, but I do think there's a benign alternative, uh, you know, way to describe this that more talks about the kind of counterterrorism economy that sits beneath a lot of these issues. There is, it's impossible to ignore after 20 years, um, the institutions, the workforce, the, the budgets have all created a kind of internal bureaucratic politics that is going to put this option on the table uh, when in some cases um, policymakers would be better without having it presented. And that's going to be really tough to, to disentangle, especially after this administration and the toxic relationship it already has with um, with the agency and, and the law enforcement agencies and even parts of DOD. But just to give you an example of this, the what started when I was in the Counterterrorism Bureau at the State Department is the 1206 um, training and equip program for urgent and emerging terrorism needs has now become you know a massive global training and equip program under Section 333. And I think the at last check, the budget had grown by something some 10 odd per, uh, time. So um, I think that's going to be a real challenge. I will not reply on this one. Let's see if we can get some more, because I, I think those are some great responses. And as you can see, the, you know, there is uh, a lot of ways to start thinking and talking about this. Uh, Bill, I think I saw your hand, and then maybe there was in the middle here. But did I see your hand, Bill? No. No. The live streamers can't hear you. Oh, this is an embarrassing question, so I didn't want to be on mic. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so um, we haven't touched too much on this. Uh, Jeff mentioned the arms trade treaty. Um, in, in a region like the Middle East, where there's egregious sales going on, um, can we make the arms trade treaty relevant, effective? I mean, there's a lot of problems. Some of the countries aren't participating. Some aren't interpreted uh, in the spirit of, that, that they should. But the, what role does it play in some of these conflict regions? And then, uh, yeah. Um, Chloe Stein, I'm with the Stimson Center. So, Kate, you were talking about um, like long-term solutions to solving terrorism, and you were talking about getting Congress to focus on long-term solutions. But I think part of Congress not focusing them is that their constituents are not focusing on long-term solutions. So, how do you get the American people to respond to long-term solutions and to understand that these long-term solutions are going to help and aren't like? The, and they don't just want that thing that will immediately solve the solution, which I think they are seeking for. Does anybody want to do with the ATT? Or should I? Well, Rachel Stoll is like the expert. <laughs> I know. Front row. <laughs> <laughs> I feel, I'll, I'll, if I can, I'll just jump in on Bill's question around the ATT, because I, I do feel like Rachel should be up here uh, answering this one, too, because she and I haven't conferred notes on what we're seeing, and she's more engaged. There was a question earlier in the day um, that made me think about this, which is around, you know, if, if is China and Russia, are they really our competitors in this issue space, and how do we rein in the arms trade if everyone's going to be an ad, bad actor, I think is sort of the similar question. Um, and this is where you get to the arms trade treaty. The arms trade treaty is still the best potential for the world to agree on what responsible arms trade is in an international way. And I think we get really caught up in... Uh, the U.S. is the primary actor, but you know, lots of things are made with parts from many countries, and, and the arms trade itself is now not a unitary state. And I'm getting back to some of the arguments we made when the treaty was getting negotiated, but I still think that's true. And I think the arms trade treaty, uh, I think we're seeing it more in Europe, actually. The, the challenges to what I think many of us who would say arms sales to the Saudi Arabia's don't fit the letter or spirit of the treaty. You are seeing those legal suits in the U.K., Sam Perlow Freeman has a good blog post about a, a legal case being tried also, at, I think, at The Hague. Uh, not The Hague. Um, but there are legal mechanisms also being tried. The more that some countries are putting pressure on their governments to be more responsible, I think, has a knock-on effect. Uh, and, and that's where I think <clears throat> the, the treaty hasn't yet lived up to its full potential, but I think many of us are still pushing for those conversations to happen at the treaty meetings. and. 
in places where countries are part of the treaty fully, especially in Europe, I think you are seeing a great deal of pressure for behavioral change. And I think it's those behavioral changes, when they become part of the norm to really tackle these tough questions, we'll see moving forward. I'll have to talk with Rachel afterwards to see if that, you, that response makes sense or not. Go ahead. Can I just add something real quick on this? Because it's not. <laughs> I just want to add something real quick. Because <laughs> you, st you started. You started talking about the candidates' positions on the ATT, and I think very much to this point that you're finishing on, I'm almost less concerned with the kind of commitment to joining, ratifying, whatever, the ATT that I am looking for, what the candidates' perspective is in American leadership on international law writ large. We, have, we live in fear, number one, of liability, and two, constraining our strategic flexibility in the application of the use of force around the world. What we need to be doing is leading in both of those things by constraining ourselves and submitting ourselves to accountability. And in that way, I think we can generate the kind of momentum we need to make the ATT, but a broad suite of other international treaties more meaningful. And I think the US has just got to start leading on that. Kate, did you want to, and others can also run this, how to get American people to respond also, long term. Also co-sign what Dan just said. Yeah, Dan, that was great. <laughs> Um, so it's a great question. I think particularly we hear a lot in D.C. that the U.S. public doesn't really care about foreign policy. They're never going to vote on it. So why would you even try to talk to them about it or mobilize them on it? And it's really interesting because you see poll after poll after poll actually indicate that the U.S. public is way farther ahead than anyone in D.C., and so like, it, it becomes this kind of like weird dissonance where you're just like, well, then why aren't their representatives actually doing what they elected them to do or what they believe, right? And so I think part of this is in terms of showing that the long-term solutions are actually will bring their short-term gains. And I think one, one way that I think what Diana mentioned about demographics is really, really important is that while, you know, perhaps older Americans still think of security in a kind of us versus them, fortress America mentality in some circles, that I think there's a growing recognition, particularly amongst youth in this country, particularly with an existential threat like climate change knocking at their door, that security is really about how can we make ourselves safer which is based upon other people in the world also being safe. It's a shared security framework. And so it's really, which FCNL coined back in the day, um, I will not take credit for it. Um, and I think that also really fits in with what Americans value say should be their view of security. Um, that really we know we become safer when other people become safer, the kind of lift all boats theory. And so one way um, that we talk about at Women Without War, which is a national grassroots advocacy organization, so we actively engage with the public, we mobilize people, take action on a large swath of foreign policy um, issues that the U.S. government uh, deals with, is we talk to folks about these issues from a, a values perspective. Um, do you believe your government should be creating a famine in Yemen? which is a country a few years ago, most people didn't even know where it was. Um, and it got it out of these questions out of a frame of, well, should we be supporting Saudi Arabia in a proxy war against Iran in this country you've never heard of, which most Americans will then say, well, we don't know, I don't know enough about that to weigh in. Um, you have to let the experts deal with that. And when you kind of break it down in these much more, um, not simplistic terms, but really, in terms that really speak to regular people, um, if they were thinking about, well, I wouldn't want another government coming to my country and causing a famine, like why would we do that, right? Um, and it, the same goes with when you talk about trade-offs. Um, and we see this a lot with the Pentagon's budget and we have seen it actually on the Democratic uh, presidential campaign trail where you have a lot of these progressive priorities like Medicare for all, like a Green New Deal, Blue New Deal, all of these things that would take massive public investment. Um, and the first question out of any pundit's mouth is how do you pay for it? And folks, a lot of folks who are supporting those candidates who are talking about these initiatives have a more holistic view of security where it's not just what is my physical security, it's what is my economic security, what is my health security, what is my family's security, what's my community's security overall. And I think when you then 
show evidence of, well, we're investing all of this money, at, you know, $45 billion a year to wage war in Afghanistan, almost 18 years on, versus investing that money in doubling the State Department's budget, where we could then resource peace building to actually help that country slowly um, move towards more accountable governments, anti-corruption initiatives, other things that would bring security to the people of Afghanistan, which is what many Americans think about. Um, in addition to that would also decrease the influence of violent groups that perpetrate terrorism, which is ultimately the security goal that we say we're there for, right? And so regular people get it. We're just not talking to them about it. And so that's where it's really exciting to see a lot of the presidential candidates start to talk about these domestic policy priorities and then the trade-off that we're making on the security end. And so if we can continue making those connections, it doesn't necessarily become this short-term versus long-term conversation anymore. It's what do you want for your life? And oh, wait, if we actually go about things differently, it'll also benefit other people. We could be a model for other countries in doing these things. That's what I want my government to be doing. Did you want to plug your the new series that's out? Oh. Um, well, relatedly, thanks, Jeff. Uh, uh, Winners at War, Oxfam, FCNL, um, Move On, and a bunch of other groups have come together to do a digital series of interviews with presidential candidates about foreign policy to increase the public's access um, to these conversations about what they believe the United States' role in the world should be, um, because this never gets debated, largely. Um, on the campaign trail, except when we're on the brink of war with Iran. <laughs> um, so uh, that just launched today, actually. Um, it's on different social media platforms, as well as use role in the world, or us in the world .org. Um, So you can go check it out. The first interview just got launched, and they'll be rolling out before the um, fe February 3rd caucus in Iowa. Sweet. Did you want to add anything on this? I don't, I, mean, I don't have much to add because I agree with all of what was said, but I, I just want to reiterate that the American public is not the problem. Mm -hmm. They're not the ones who are leading us into all these wars and these excessive expenditures. But we do need to acknowledge the problem of the politicization of fear, mm -hmm. also known as demagoguery. Mm -hmm. And the result is the 30-second attack ad, which every politician lives in perpetual fear of. Mm -hmm. And even though... The, the people aren't the ones that are creating these fears. They do often respond to them. And I, I don't have an immediate answer to that, but we, we do have um, a lot of work to do to get people feeling comfortable in not being suckered by, mm -hmm. those, by those ads and those appeals. Great. I'd like to open it up for another round of questions. Hopefully, we'll, I think this might be the last round that I... Jeff, you have one over here. Oh, sorry. You saw it. Great socks. Go ahead, Steve. Uh, thanks. Steve Hargarden from the Medical College of Wisconsin. I haven't heard about the companies that are involved in those guns that have been confiscated, let's say, in Mexico, 70% of the U.S. Who are those manufacturers? And is there a strategy to have the shareholders talk to the gun companies about their roles in the distribution of their product to other countries? Second question. Comment. I might wax a little bit on. Oh, n right next. Yeah, no. Oh, I, I was almost saying. All right. Um, yeah, wax slightly off topic, but then I'll let's see if anybody can answer that question. But thanks for raising it. Um, on Kate's point about <clears throat> educating the public and the public being active, I, part of what I also do is work broadly in the field of humanitarian disarmament which uh, <clears throat> the Foreign Arms Trade deals with when we talk about landmines, cluster munitions, the Arms Trade Treaty. And one of the, some of the most exciting things I see happening in our issue space broadly is when the public is driving change. Uh, this happened around cluster munitions and disinvestment in, in cluster munitions. Ted Lieu actually talked about when he got to Congress and how there was a vote on cluster munitions. But, um, U.S. policy has not been to not have these weapons anymore, but because of the way the global commu community has moved and pressure on investors, these weapons aren't really used anymore. They're really inhumane, and they're not a, a popular weapon, and the United States pretty much doesn't use them also. I think you're seeing public pressure on pieces of weapons industry or the arms trade in interesting ways. Another one, obviously, we're not, we didn't talk about it here, 
but we're going to have the next panel is going to show part of this, this show, Madam Secretary, which does a great job of sort of framing these things for the for a public community. They took on killer robots. Now, killer robots is an issue that uh, isn't trade right now because they don't exist, but they're being created. But you have Google employees saying, I don't want to be a part of this. And it's really changed the conversation. People involved in that industry have changed the conversation. I think we have seen domestically at times a, lump, a number of uh, credit card companies and stores that sell sporting goods say, I'm not going to sell guns anymore, right? I mean, I think that we see public pressure applied in ways that we don't necessarily, because we write in our silos, think about those creative possibilities. Uh, but I think they're out there. So I don't have the direct answer to the question, but I think that there are times that you do see the public engage to move things, not from policy wonks in Washington, but from a different understanding of these issues. And I think those are really, really exciting. A couple of things that I think make this particularly hard, because I think this is a great question, something we need to think more deeply about is, one, I think the major companies that are producing conventional arms for export have massive commercial aerospace and industrial capabilities that are bound up in their stocks. And so that makes it really tough to figure out how to attack that through shareholders. Um, I'm sure there are probably ways. The second is, I, I think, in, in bundled stocks, mutual funds, it's really hard. Code Pink actually did a, a resource where you can put your, um, yeah. your retirement account into the system and it'll tell you what, what shares you hold. I have Vanguard and I can tell you right now, I own stocks of like Raytheon and Boeing, I'm ashamed to say, but oh. I do check my accounts every day like, seeing how long it'll take me to retire. But I mean, that's part of the problem <laughs> in the American psyche. Um, the third thing is if you look at the prospectus from these companies and if you look at their publicly available materials, there's very sl um, slick kind of um, advertising around the munitions that are causing the most problem. In fact, if you look at the producers of of a lot of the munitions that were that were used in Saudi, for example, they're actually marketing those on the basis of the precision capabilities it gives the, the force that's using it. So they're saying these are actually more humane weapon systems. So I think it's a really tough uh, tackle, uh, challenge to, to tackle, not you know, to mention even the, the congressional uh, issues. I remember when I was at State and we talked about a particular country in the Middle East and would say like when, when the arms manufacturers would go up to the hill, they wouldn't take a picture of this country. They would take a, a map of the United States and all the, where all the factories were. Um, to guide their, their conversations with the Congress. So I think it's, um, it's particularly tough, but not impossible. I agree with Dan that it's tough. Um, I think, you know, one thing that recently came out that's interesting to think about is how um, campaign finance reform could actually address part of Congre like the hold that these manufacturers have on Congress, not only through campaign contributions, but taking kind of a step back when you're considering a candidate, looking at where they invest their money. Um, there was a great report on Sludge about how all of these members of Congress and the levels in which they have invested their own personal capital as well as their family's capital in defense contractors. And it's interesting to see, like, there's a lot of folks who you expect, and there's, like, some progressive champions who also do that. Um, and so I think it's a, it's accountability tool that I think should be used, if not by shareholders, um, but can be used by the public to campaign in a really creative way. One lesson, I think, for shareholder activism um, or just uh, lobbying uh, arms manufacturers for corporate responsibility on these things um, is that Amnesty International USA actually ran a campaign um, when uh, the arms sales um, from Raytheon were going to Saudi Arabia and they sent letters to Raytheon asking, will you please you know, stop selling these weapons? There's all this evidence they're being used against civilians in unlawful ways. You're complicit in war crimes, all of these things. And the response that they got, which I think is really um, indicative of what needs to happen, is that they, Raytheon responded saying, well, the US State Department said mm -hmm. that I could get this export license. And so as a result of that, the US government's decision um, you're allowed to do this, so you should go talk to the U.S. government. And so that's where there's kind of this, like, who is to blame, who pulls the levers problem that exists, and really, even though it can be the most challenging, this institutional reform that needs to happen on the federal level is really critical to getting the companies to behave differently. 
Oh, we have another question. And I just want to say, as I look around the room, there's all these, there's like six other people I'd love to call on to give their response on this question. And there's a number of people who are actually in the defense industry in the room, too, will have a different take. So I think there's lots of fodder for when we get to the breaks and to the reception to continue that part of the conversation. But let's take another question right here. Sorry, that's really the thing that I've been grappling with through this whole discussion is um, the accountability of the arms sales and who is really accountable for the end result of that arms sales. So if, how, are, how can you um, advocate for legislation that there needs to be signature on these big sales to countries where we know that they're going to use them for terrible things? That senator's name is going to be on that sale, and he or she does not want to be accountable. So do we go back to the, um, do we then require legislation that the person who is uh, accountable are those people who are actually making these, these machines? So where do we put that accountability? Who's going to sign for it? And, and, and how do we push for that more in this full process? I don't know if that's as clearly defined as it really needs to be. And I think that's a big piece of the discussion that we're, we're not getting to. And can you just introduce yourself? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Jesse Ginther. I work for Center for Civilians in Conflict. Great. Thank you. Um, and I think as we answer this, if you have any closing remarks for this panel, make them now. I think we'll take a break. Um, but uh, I want to get Brittany up here to talk about some of the legal stuff, too. But so there's just there's some really interesting thoughts running through. But does anybody want to jump? on that yeah um. i'll just say i mean there's accountability at all levels and we have to address this problem at, at all, in all the ways that people have suggested at the manufacturers from the influence of foreign governments at the um you know the uh through uh, congressional campaign contributions and the whole uh campaign system um, and then through legislation, through the executive branch. It's not, there's not like one solution where just one person's going to be held responsible. But the idea of, of flipping the script on arms sales mm -hmm. is that if senators and members of Congress have to put their name on this sale, in, a, in other words, it doesn't happen unless they approve it, they're going to be a lot more careful about what they say yes to. That's all I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> just listening to Diana, I'll just leave you all with uh, the great song by Bob Dylan, Who Killed Davy Moore, because that's exactly what I thought of, because the question is who's responsible for the death of the boxer in the arena, and I think your, your point is exactly like Bob Dylan's point. I didn't have anything else to add, but it's such a great song, I thought. <laughs> I fully agree with Diana, unsurprisingly. <laughs> um, I mean, I think like that's the thing is that there has to be accountability at all levels. And part of it is, and I think going back to Dan's point a, a little bit ago, it's not just about accountability on this export control or the use of this weapon. It's broader. The US government does not hold itself accountable to international law writ large for the most part. Um, they, the DOD in particular has done a really good job of kind of carving out all of these different caveats of why different parts of international law don't apply to the U.S. government. And if we really want to see change globally on this, I think we have to be urging our government to take kind of that bigger step of how are we actually going to hold ourselves accountable, admit we did wrong, admit mistakes, which we see every day. Politicians just can't say they're wrong for some reason. Um, and have that humility to say, but we want to do better, and here's how we're actually going to actualize that in a transparent way. And that's how then, for all of the, uh, I think, worry in Washington about comp peer competitors and losing market share, that um, ultimately we can hold others accountable if we hold ourselves accountable first. And I'm just I'm circling back to what Representative Lou said at the beginning. I think there are these moments where the circles on both sides and you get these co co coalitions. But, you know, I, there have been enough egregious things happening in the last few years that I think you see in certain issues a bipartisan effort for Congress to reclaim responsibility on X, Y, Z issues. And if we can get them to also recognize this, which I don't think is that far a lift given what's already happened in the last few years, that there is that possibility where they will say, okay, yes, it is time for us we can't maybe do every arm sale, as Diana's saying, but we can s select a set. And I, I think you'll see legislation that starts that process going. And I, you know, I think that is something that, to end on a bit of optimism, I do think you, we are seeing Congress recognizing 
regardless of party at this point, it's that they need to have a bigger role uh, moving forward. And I think those moments come, and you have to take advantage of them when they happen. I want to thank and ask you to help me thank our panelists for their expert thoughts and some great thinking. We originally, when we made the agenda, were not going to have a break and cookies and sugar, but we have it now. So take a little break. We have to set up a little bit for the technology so that we can show the film and also have David Gray join us. Uh, so please take a little break and be back, I think, at 3.40 is the plan. I know, I know we've lost some of our audience. Perhaps they were so excited from the last panel, Jeff, that they decided to move on. <laughs> okay. Great, okay. Um, my name is Colby Goodman, and I'm a consultant with Transparency International Defense and Security and I'm gonna be the moderator for the next panel, which is titled Arms Trade and Popular Drama, Madam Secretary and the Strategic, Ambi and Strategic Ambiguity. Uh, but before we get into the panel, uh, with one of the co-creators of the show, David Gray, behind me. Um, Not we, quite a co-creator, okay. executive producer and the Barbara Hall creator. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so we have a special treat for you. CBS has kindly allowed us to show one of the episodes, uh, the episode called Strategic Ambiguity. Um, and it sort of dives deep into the military industrial complex and arms trade issues for which we were sort of just talking about. Um, for the purposes uh, of, of the video that we're about to show you. Um, we're, not, we're not showing you the whole video. It's, it's, gonna, it's gonna be about 31 minutes. Um, and so I apologize for the people online or live streaming that are gonna be watching it. It's gonna be difficult for you. Um, I also am required to say that uh, please refrain from uh, recording or streaming the video in any way. Um, I'll, I'll, after all that has gone through, um, I really hope you enjoy this, and I look forward to the discussion afterwards. Thank you. So for the interest of time, we, we cut it a little bit short. I'm hoping we can get David back on. He should be, he's there. He's there. Okay. Um, yeah, I hear you and I see you. Okay. <laughs> we can't see you. Well, he's in the corner. Oh, I can see a big boy. Oh, you can see him in the small, okay. Okay, great. Get my notes here. Okay, so wow, what, an, what a doozy of an episode, as Mandy tol told me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, I think one of the great things about the, the Madam Secretary and these shows like that, you can feel it, like you, you can experience it for yourself. A little bit worries me that I'm sort of Gary Martin sometimes, but uh, the political military affairs person. Uh, <laughs> There are so many issues to talk about uh, in this episode a and other episodes uh, uh, that talk about arms trade. And we're going to get a little bit into those other episodes. Um, but first, I just I want to say, uh, so again, my name is Colby Goodman. I'm with Tran uh, Transparency International Defense and Security, a consultant. Um, and TIDS, as we say, we fight, it, we fight corruption in the defense sector, which is often the, the least transparent and the least accountable. Uh, and today, uh, we released a report called Holes in the Net. Uh, I can't remember the title now. <laughs> uh, it's right here. Um, U.S. arms export control gaps in combating corruption. And uh, Jody, who is here today, we, uh, released a report in December that sort of gets into 
the sort of cycles of influence. It has a great chart here, so I encourage you to take a look at that. Um, so, I mean, I think for, for a lot of us that have been working on these issues, um, it's great to see shows like this get, uh, bring, bring the issue to, to the public uh, and then try to engage um, a, a broader a group of people to so, so then they can potentially use that and influence Congress as we were talking about in the last panel. Um, so I'd like to thank David uh, for his work on that. Um, and I think, as I understand it, that when this show was released, it reached, uh, there was six million viewers, and perhaps a lot more viewers after that. And there are other episodes that have reached up to 15 or 20 million, maybe. Um, so, so I'm going to introduce the panel. Uh, for those of you who don't know David, he has also written uh, other, or participated in writing in other TV shows. Uh, including Without a Trace and Castle. Castle is one of my favorites. Uh, in person, we have two subject experts to my left here to unpack some of the issues raised in this episode and other issues. Mandy Smithberger, uh, who's the director for the Center for, De De Center for Defense Information at the Project on Government Reform, Government Oversight, sorry. Uh, and I'm gonna try to do a little fun. So her name uh, anagrams into Big Heart and Mastermind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It sounds like we need a big heart, though. Right, 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 right. <laughs> uh, So Brittany Benowitz, to, uh, to Mandy's left, is the chief counsel at the American Bar Association Center for Human Rights. And her name anagrams into Witty Robin. <laughs> so uh, David, if you're envious, I can do you too. It just wasn't as gracious. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to try it myself. Oh, yeah. So what I came up with, for your name was it's much shorter, so it's harder than the other other folks here. It's I ravaged. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I won't make an off-color joke about that. But I my wife for okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, so uh, unlike the the previous panels, we're gonna have sort of a discussion format, and I'm gonna pose some questions uh, to David and the rest of the panelists, and then after that, we'll, we'll we look forward to to your questions. And I think I will give the first question to the person who figures out who the anonymous tip was. Okay, Rachel. Ra <laughs> okay, maybe not Rachel. Someone who hadn't seen the show before, right. Uh, okay, so David, uh, it was great to see Madam Secretary raise so many U.S. arms export control challenges and issues throughout the different seasons in Madam Secretary. Did you initially set out to focus on these issues or did they sort of develop over time? And I wonder if you could uh, get into a, a little bit of the, the sort of dual meanings behind strategic ambiguity. Sure. Um, so, you know, what we realized early on, and really Barbara Hall, the creator of the show, her vision for the show was to do um, civics Um <laughs> And what we figured out was that if you take some, uh, you know, arcane government workings or you know, documents or even the Constitution itself, but you, you dramatize um, some of these aspects of them. If you put them on their feet, it could make for great drama. And really, all we wanted to do was um, entertain, but educate a bit, because I think when people get educated, they lean in a little, they're interested uh, in the inner workings of government. Um, you know, we've done other episodes, you know, not for nothing, we did. Uh, Barbara and I wrote an episode uh, called Sound and Fury, which dramatized, uh, put on its feet, Section 4 of the 25th Amendment, um, which, you know, you have no reason. Um, <laughs> and, uh, some of you, well, I think you all know what that was about. We also put Article 5 of, of the NATO um, treaty on its feet. Um, you know, if one country is attacked, all the other countries uh, will, will, you know, it's, it's an attack on all. Um, so some of these arcane concepts, when you put them on their feet, um, could be really dramatic and interesting. And that's really why we chose, uh, you know, any particular episode. Um, that may not be exactly the answer you're look, looking for, Colby, but it, it's honest that, you know, we're doing a show prime time on CBS. Um, but again, we could sneak in um, what we like to call like the spinach, you know, the lesson, the learning. Um, and this episode, Strategic Ambiguity, um, was born of a few things. Um, 
you know, I remember reading an article years ago about how I, it might have been. Obviously, this episode is based on the F thirty five. But um, but I, I'm not sure if it was the F thirty five or some other military project. But I read an article, you know, maybe twenty years ago, about how one particular project was built in forty percent of all congressional districts in the United States, and that line even made it into the episode which was just so shocking and surprising. But, but when you get the politics behind it, um, you, you know, it makes sense. And another article I read years ago was how Tom Daschle, someone who I, I, I liked uh, when he was in office, um, he kept, um, he always made sure a military project kept getting funded, even though the military said, we don't want it. It was some, maybe it was a helicopter or some, you know, something we were spending hundreds of millions or billions of dollars on, but it was him bringing home the bacon uh, to South Dakota. Um, not to cast aspersions on Tom Daschle, but that's true. Um, and, and so, you know, we thought to ourselves, how could you put um, this on its feet? And then what we do, if you're interested in our process, is we had um, uh, consultants at Glover Park uh, they actually have a Hollywood um, unit, um, and they would help us fill out the details. You know, how would you get into this? Strategic ambiguity is just a really interesting concept to us. We didn't get into it too much in the episode, but the, again, I don't need to explain to you our policy towards Taiwan um, and China. And, um, and anyway, so that's, you know, that's sort of the genesis of the episode. I hope I answered your question, Cole. Yeah, no, th thank you, David. I mean, I think in some ways I was more interested in like what Gary Martin was talking about and his strategic ambiguity, what he was sort of picking up there. But um, and one of my one of my favorite lines from from Ma uh, Madam Secretary in another episode is when the secretary is sort of uh, talking about talking with the Defense Department on whether to provide lethal weapons to Ukraine, and the Defense Department guy, I think it's Scott or something was saying, oh, well, all we need to do is just provide them lethal weapons and that, that will solve the problem. And she was like, that is not a strategy. <laughs> like, that, like, that is not a strategy. Um, so next I would like to turn to, to Mandy. Um, the, this episode raises a bunch of issues uh, that you've worked on for a, a long time on military industrial complex. And I wonder if you could unpack some of the challenges uh, that you have found in defense procurement and arms sales that the issue raises, um, such as like, does the Pentagon sometimes push for arms sales for economies of scale and other and others that seem sort of unneedy, unneeded or risky? And is it possible to push back against these these you know cycles of influence? Sure. Um, so. I have to say that 40% of congressional districts is low when it comes to the F-35, that it's really spread much further. So it's kind of that corruption is even deeper and more endemic than I mean, it's in one case where Hollywood kind of undersells rather than dramatizes the nature of the problem. Um, and we certainly see DOD pushing these kinds of sales, claiming that we're going to get savings. Um, don't always see the follow-up work being done to see if those savings actually accrued, in many cases that they haven't. One of the lines that I found the most striking throughout was that, you know, we're not ready for this fight of taking on the biggest defense contractor. And at least in my experience, when we were working on canceling the F-22, the kind of being ready for this fight meant that you needed to have the Secretary of Defense supporting you, the Secretary of the Air Force supporting you, that you needed to have the chair and ranking member of the Senate Armed Services Committee um, you really had to have a coordinated campaign, and you know, along with the press, journalists, kind of everyone had to be on board. And even then, there were it didn't look like that cancellation was going to happen. There was one vote that went sideways because a member of Congress fell asleep. Like so, all of these kinds of things. When you're going against the military-industrial complex, you need to have all of your duckies in a row. And even then, you still might not win because of things like. Um, spreading out jobs across congressional districts, which we refer to as political engineering campaign finance reform. Um, you know, if you really went into this, the former staffers for the members of Congress would probably be calling and lobbying their members too because they got a job in the defense industry or at Glover Park Group. So I, I think this, uh, you know, this uh, episode really lays out the issue as well. 
Thanks, Mandy. Uh, so, David, I'm going to turn back to you. The show, uh, and Gary Martin does this, points a lot to the need for a value-based foreign policy, some of which we talked about, Dan talked about in, the, in, the, in our last panel. Um, so some of, the, some of the episodes that have included this um, is, is corruption, uh, U.S. support for a sort of an autocratic leader in Angola, um, now, uh, of course, Ukraine. Um, at the same time, the, the secretary sometimes has to make some difficult ethical choices and take some out-of-the-box decisions to achieve her goals or pr priorities. I wonder if you could talk about how, when you were thinking in the show, how you're trying to strike that balance. And how do you, did you have sort of an idea in your head, like, oh, here, here's where that balance is? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. Um, you know, a, a big part of the show is dramatizing, it is humanizing um, in as much as it's possible these Washington types. <laughs> um, so, you know, the Secretary of State is a mother, she's a, a wife, she's a friend, she, she, you know, there are personal stories on the staff. Um, but the, I think the brilliant thing that Barbara did when she created the show was and so many people have said, oh, it's, it's Hillary Clinton, they're doing Hillary Clinton. Barbara, the first thing she said when CBS approached her about it was that she didn't want to do Hillary Clinton. Um, and she specifically made this character not political. Um, if you know the show, you know she came out of the CIA, um, where she was a top analyst uh, who worked for um, the CIA director, Keith Car President Keith Carradine, when he was CIA director. Um, she worked for him, so she, he brings her on as a real out-of-the-box choice because she's an out-of-the-box out of thinker. Um, so she never has political desires, even though in the last season of the show we make her president, just for fun. Um, but it was specifically a character who wasn't political. What, and the State Department isn't supposed to be political. Again, don't you know, look at what's happening right now in the world. Um, but by definition, it's not supposed to be political. Um, so, um, it, so she's a pragmatic. So we wanted a character who's a pragmatic thinker. Who, you know, for instance, in one episode, and I'm not sure if this is what you're referring to, Colby. Um, she's trying to make a deal. We did this episode a few years ago, trying to make a deal with the Taliban uh, to end um, the war in Afghanistan because the only way to end the war is through a deal. Um, and what we predicted, what would happen, and, and I have to say, we often got it right, we always tried to stay ahead of the curve, um, was that some deal would have to be struck where we cave on women's rights. And we thought that would be really interesting for a female Secretary of State to be confronted with making that decision um, and to get behind it, uh, to get behind saying, well, this is where this country is now, and it's the best we could do. Um, all things considered. So, you know, we always tried, we didn't want to be too wonderful. Uh, it, we didn't want our episodes to wrap up too neatly in a bow. I think we often get accused of that just because we do wrap up stories in 42, and, 42 minutes and 38 seconds uh, every week. <laughs> and, you know, time, story time we have. Um, but, uh, but so that's, you know, we, we, we tried to make it as, um, as, uh, as, um, you know, try to make her come up with out of the box solutions um, for you know in, in, for very difficult problems. Great, thank you. I mean, I think I liked some of the solutions that that you that you come up come up with uh, over the episodes. Uh, so next, I'd like to turn to Brittany. Um, there's another episode, uh, which a topic which Brittany has been working on a lot, and unfortunately we didn't have time to talk about that. And that it's actually the next episode in season five called Proxy Wars, uh, and of course it's very timely at the moment, given U.S. support for Saudi Arabia and U.S. support for Iraq and what's going on in Libya. Uh, so, Brittany, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that episode and some of the themes that are raised in that episode, and and sort of how do you connected to, 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 selfishly to my issues, uh, <laughs> to how like corruption affects uh, uh, U.S. sort of assessment of, 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 of our partners and sort of the sometimes conflicts of interest. 
Sure. Well, first of all, let me just say I like it they got wrapped up in 42 minutes. It makes me kind of want to just watch this series and not read the news because <laughs> I felt much calmer after watching that episode. Um, so this episode shows how the defense industry warps foreign policy decisions, or almost in this case. Yeah. The next episode about proxy warfare shows how foreign partner nations can also warp uh, U.S. foreign policy. So in that the proxy warfare episode, proxies that we are, that the United States has armed in the Middle East are involved in a conflict, and they almost suck the United States into the conflict with Russia. And then again, the Secretary saves the day. So um, I think what I took away from that episode is actually that uh, while it's easy to have these foils of the defense industry and these foreign nations who uh, have their own interests and they're not necessarily aligning with the uh, U.S. interests, that the reality is that there's a larger self-inflicted wound going on here, that the State Department isn't a rational actor and it is not necessarily assessing its own influence in a very realistic uh, manner. And I think you don't need to look any further than the headlines today. You know, over the last 20 years, we've invested hundreds of billions of dollars into building up the security forces of Iraq and Afghanistan, and neither of them can control their own territory. They, the Iraqi military can't even keep Iranian-backed militias from ambushing a U.S. embassy. I mean, that is not something that we can blame on defense contractors, and that's not something we can blame on foreign proxies. We have to own up to the fact of our own shortcomings and our own strategic planning, and we have to get serious about understanding that local partners, local countries that are buying these weapons have different interests than we do. And if we want to achieve our goals, we need a different set of carrots and sticks to achieve that. So uh, where I work, the American Bar Association, we just completed this study looking at proxy warfare in the Middle East. And uh, what we found in that study is this sort of interest divergence between local proxies and the United States is the norm, right? They have their own agenda. They're trying to survive in a difficult neighborhood. And it doesn't matter if we sell them tens of billions of dollars of weapons. What they're interested in is self-preservation, regardless of what that means for the United States. Uh, we also found in the study that proxy warfare makes uh, wars longer and also makes it more likely that they're going to commit atrocities and that they're always characterized by escalatory dynamics. So in 75% of wars where there's a foreign power intervenes in internal armed conflict, another foreign power intervenes. So basically, if you just take this research and you project out, what you can see is that the con what used to be one or two wars in the Middle East that have now become five or ten where we have hundreds of different parties of conflict, that trend's going to continue until the different sponsor states, whether you're talking about Russia, the United States, Saudi Arabia, Iran, until all of the, uh, the sponsor states realize that it's spinning out of control. And I often think back on an article that Barnett Rubin and Ahmed Rashid wrote about Afghanistan 10 years ago, and the, they said the title of the article was The Great Game Isn't Fun Anymore. And this is a reference to the fact that the competition for influence between Russia and the Great Britain 100 years ago in Afghanistan uh, was called the great game, right? It used to be fun to just go off in these little the hinterlands and sell weapons to local militias. But in an age of blowback, in an age of the Mujahideen morphing into al-Qaeda, it's really it's not fun anymore. And until that, we come to terms with that uh, and have a foreign policy based on, based on that understanding, I think you're going to continue to see us making the same strategic mistakes. Thanks, Brittany. Mm -hmm. um, so I have one more question, but I, in the interest of time, uh, I'll open it up to the audience and then and maybe I can squeeze in my question at, at some point. Uh, so, does anyone know who the anonymous tipper was? Besides Rachel. Yeah? Oh, that would have been interesting. Uh, no, it was the congressman that, that was friends with Secretary McCord's uh, husband. So, okay. I'll still take it from you. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, uh, in a previous role, uh, sorry, Ursula Knizamato with Friends Committee on National Legislation. Um, in a previous role at Alliance for Peace Building, we'd worked with um, Sandra Buffington De Castro um, out of USC's Public Health School, and she talked a lot about kind of inserting these storylines into television around like blood donor in numbers or rape kit analysis in SVU. And I was just curious kind of if you've seen from your show or other shows, if you've seen actual like impact in how people are responding to these issues or, you know, because foreign policy is such a hard thing to get people to do something on or kind of change people's opinions. And I was just curious if you knew sort of the impact your shows had. Dave? Um. 
Yeah, um, I think, you know, we've been uh, told and warned uh, since the jump, since the get-go, that most of what people in foreign countries know about um, American foreign policy comes from TV shows, uh, like The West Wing or Madam Secretary. So we really felt the responsibility uh, to get it right. And, it, you know, we may do it, again, a little quick, uh, but we try to get it um, as much right as possible, uh, particularly on big issues. So I think there really is an impact. And, you know, we, you know CBS Le um, Legal and Corporate um, also holds our feet to the fire. We, we can't cast aspersions that are unfair um, to other countries. And I'll give you just a, a, a quick example. Um, in an episode I wrote early on, um, the U.S. was trying to, in season one, the U.S. was making a deal with Iran, um, similar to the nuclear deal. Um, and as part of the episode, um, in, in Iran, uh, the government of Iran to show their people that they weren't going soft. On the same day that they were signing the treaty with the United States, um, they were stoned, they um, had sentenced the gay man to death. They were going to stone him to death for being gay. Um, and in the episode, um, one of our characters argued, Jay, the character of Jay, the, um, at the time he was um, a part, he was a, a policy advisor to, to the Secretary of State, argued we shouldn't sign the deal unless they don't stop, unless they agree not to stone this guy to death. And the real politic of it was um, Secretary of State Leone says, no, we're signing the deal, we're not, we're not gonna use that leverage. And, and he gives, makes an impassioned speech about exactly what happens to the human body when you're stoned to death. It was one of the longest speeches um, we've ever had in the show. And I got a call right before we were about to shoot it that CBS corporate, CBS corporate said we can't do it because Iran's policy since 2003 has been that they don't stone gay people to death. And I argued that Human Rights Watch, which had worked with us on the episode, said they absolutely do. That's their policy, but they look the other way when villages, local governments um, in the hinterlands in, in Iran go ahead and, and stone gay people to death for being gay. So I argued, we argued, I hit the roof because there was nothing out. It was the, it was the emotional core of the episode. Um, but then they, CBS came back, okay, as long as we put it that way. So I just had to, we just had to spell out that even though Iran's policy, official policy is they don't spell gay people to death for being gay, they still look the other way and allow it to happen. Um, and so um, it's a long-winded way of answering your question. I mean, we, we get it right. And, you know, I, we've gotten a lot of letters especially from, from, young, from girls and young women saying that they might not have been interested in government, but seeing Teo Leone as this strong, empowered, intelligent, amazing woman, um, you know, making a difference in the world, inspired them. So I think it absolutely makes an enormous difference. I can tell you also that, I, I, and maybe um, the American Bar Association could confirm this, but I read a story years ago that when L.A. Law was really popular, the David E. Kelly show, I believe, it, or it's Pachka, whichever, um, L.A. Law was really popular back in the 90s. Um, it, admissions to law, like applications to law school went up dramatically. Um, so I think these shows make a difference, and they, I think they make a difference for America around the world. I don't think they could make, they could go up against the, the tweeter in chief, you know? I don't think, given what it, Disaster our government, our State Department is, is today. Um, you know, we it became it was really weird for our show because in right in the middle of our run, Trump became got elected president. Um, so to be just doing this sort of counter programming <laughs> um, and uh, aspirational programming in the midst of that was was interesting. But so yeah, I, I think it makes a difference. But again, not again. You know what's happening in the news. Thanks, David. Uh, did, did, did you guys want to comment? I would definitely work for Taylor Leone. Oh yeah. <laughs> and I did love LA Law. <laughs> 
and, and uh, may, maybe not with this specific yeah. show, I don't know offhand, but I know a lot of people that we talk to who are interested in military reform issues saw Pentagon Wars, and that really formulates how they look at these issues. So I think yeah. it can be very powerful. I mean, probably uh, Rachel and I remember Lord of War having a huge impact. Uh, Jeff, too. Um, okay, Rachel, you have a follow-up question? I do have a follow-up question. And then I think Jeff wants to go next. Yes, the, I want them too. Very brilliant, um, yeah. here. Um, so Mandy and Brittany are the two smartest women I know on this topic. So normally I would be asking them a question, but I could talk to them anytime. So I'm going to turn my <laughs> question to David because I was really impressed. I have to be honest, this was the first time I had seen a Madam Secretary episode. And I feel now I've been shamed that that is a terrible um, experience and I need to go back and watch every episode. Um, but I was really impressed by some of the wonky inside baseball, inside Washington things that you had in this episode. Like when there was a discussion about the decision making process and authorizations and, you know, it was like, well, DRL's point of view gets, you know, pushed aside all the time. I mean, there was just lines in there that I was really impressed with um, that I think all of us who work on these issues recognize. And so I had two questions. One, how do you make how do you do that sort of in this Hollywood? Um, I'm making a television show that has to be entertaining. How do you get those little nuggets? because I think people in this room have lots of ideas for episodes and would want to know, um, you know, not just for this show, which I know is not airing anymore, but other shows. So how do we, how do we share those story ideas or those little anecdotes that um, would make, uh, you know, good television? Well, we all would think would make good television. And I was just following on your question, your point about the pushback um, about the Iranians. And I remember when the West Wing aired, they never used names of real countries, like they'd make up a country about right. with bad human rights. But in this case, you were using Taiwan and you were using a fictitious company, but we all knew you were talking about the F-35 and we all sort of knew what was going on. Do any of the companies, like, do they pull their advertise? Like, is there, a, is there some kind of retribution for when you put something that, yes, it's sort of veiled, but we all know what you're talking about. I get that CBS would say you can't say bad things about Iran, but do you get sort of the industry, the corporate piece? Because the episode is about the power of the defense industry. The defense industry spends a lot of money on advertising and convincing the American public that jobs are on the line, et cetera. On things like this, do you get that kind of negative um, reaction from them as well? Right. I, I can tell you that, um, and maybe I should have said this when I first mentioned that CBS pushed back on that particular episode. Um, CBS let us do whatever we want, except for North Korea. They specifically said, and Interesting. It came from the absolute highest level after the, um, the hack. And I can tell you, like, I, we did our sound mix, which I, I don't need to explain what it is, but it's part of the process of making a show at Sony. And for a year after the North Korean hack on Sony, when you drove on the block, they didn't have your name in the computer. Everything was done on paper, and they had to write down your drive on, your past. To get, it was amazing. It was like you were back in the 1970s or 80s. Like, it was, they, didn't, they got, took all their computers offline. It was amazing what that did to Sony. And CBS did not want a piece of that. Um, <laughs> I think a lot of others. But we did whatever we wanted. Um, and uh, in terms of, Interesting questions are the, the issues, you know, we covered, we got to choose what issues mattered to us, you know, I went to an episode um, before all this started happening with the measles, like a year ago we did an episode about um, anti-vaxxers, yeah. um, and because uh, we thought that was important, and the way we get it, the way we get it right, because we, we absolutely are just dumb writers, you know, the way we get it right is we call on experts, and so, we, there's one group, which is how Colby found me, the Hollywood Health and Society. I forgot to mention. Students. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, Kate Fole, who runs it, it's a part of the Norman Lear Foundation at UCLA. Um, and USC, they look up USC. experts with TV writers. And you could be part of this if you want. And the experts do it for free because they want to get, they want us TV writers to get it right. The reason, and so sometimes, like on our anti-vaxxer episode, we had like seven experts from the CDC, maybe more. We had like 20 experts total because we wanted it to be absolutely bulletproof. 
Um, and on every episode we do, we would have not just Glover Park. Glover Park helped us with the political stuff. So that might have, some of those nuggets you're talking about very well could have come from our experts at Glover Park. Um, but we also would talk, they hook us up with specific experts in, in certain parts of the world um, or certain um, in, in, uh, industries. Um, and, uh, and so we worked with a lot of scientific experts. And the reason we do that as writers is it's more interesting. You know, it's interesting for you, but I think it's also more interesting for the audience because, you know, the first thing you learn in creative writing class in college is specificity, telling detail. You know, don't call yeah. it a bank. Call it, you know, First America on the corner of York and First, um, the one with the, the little um, cafe outside that sells the great lot. You know, you want to get, you always want to be as specific as possible. Um, and, uh, and it's funny, you know, if we didn't get all those details right, the character of Gary couldn't have been so right, which um, this writer, Matt Ward, I think did such a great job on, on, on getting that character of Gary, you know, so specific. Um, and, uh, and so, so yeah, and, and, and you know, I'll tell you just one quick thing. Um, Hollywood, it, it also works the other way. Sometimes the tail wags the dog in a good way, um, which is how, Kate, um, Hollywood Health and Society emailed me in between seasons five and six. And, they, and, um, and I was on break, you know, I, I, I didn't want to think about work, but she sent me an email saying, hey, are you interested in hearing about killer robots? And I really didn't understand what she was talking about. But I said, fuck yeah, I'm interested in hearing about killer robots. Um, so when we came back to the writer's room for the beginning of season six, we had, I wish I could remember their names, but this guy whose organization, which I think works for the UN, um, and his wife won a Nobel Prize, and his organization won a Nobel Steve? Prize, oh, you know, Steve, are yeah. making the case against fully autonomous. Human um, Rights Watch. Human Rights Watch. Yeah. What's that? Human Rights Watch. Human Rights Watch, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, um, but they came in, uh, two of the, the, the top people, or two of the people that run it, um, and made their pitch to us that we should do an episode, and we did. And, and it, was a, it was a great episode. It was called Killer Robot. <laughs> um, so, you know, it, so it's not that hard. Uh, I think it's foster think industries like to again, too. It's not that hard yeah. to get in touch with us or our show. <laughs> if you want to, you can. It's sort of like getting in touch with a congressman or a senator, you know? I mean, I think from, you know, outside the beltway, you think, oh, how can I ever, you know, reach those people? But, you know, it's really not that hard to get in touch with the show. We don't get a lot of calls. <laughs> and I'll point out that that was Foster Industries with the Killer Robots too, right? Um, I, did we go? I think it was probably for clearance yeah. reasons. <laughs> <laughs> uh, great. Uh, more questions? Oh, okay. Uh, so I'm being told we got to close up shop. Uh, what, time, what, time, what time are we? 4.52. All right, well, please... Uh, uh, join me in thanking David and Mandy and Brittany for our panel, and uh, maybe we can get <laughs> David back for another panel. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Okay. Okay. Bye. Thanks so much, everybody. I'm, I'm going to be very brief, because I know we're all ready to get to the reception. Um, but I wanted to thank everybody for sticking it out to the end. Actually, how we found out about David was I watched this Killer Robots episode with the Killer Robots campaign, and da -da -da -da, the connections were made there. But it's, it really is fascinating to think about how do we message our uh, ideas for a public audience. I, there were lots of things in that episode that I think, eh, you know, maybe, maybe not quite work that way, but it was, as Rachel said, I think we dug into lots of, lots of little details that you wouldn't normally expect to see uh, in, in a public show. Um, this was a great day. I really appreciate everyone being here. We have a reception, and I'd love to hear more on your thoughts about how this day went, how we can move forward. I'm hoping that being here gave you some ideas on the issues as well as the solutions. That was really part of the idea, framing as we started the year on how do we start thinking about this arms trade more responsibly, how do we move forward? Uh, I want to thank, really quickly, the, the 
Form on the Arm Shade actually has some sponsors. We have the Open Societies Foundation, uh, Rockefeller Brothers, and the Stuart Mott Foundation who help out, and as well as our institutional partners from um, Civic, as well as the Security Assistance Monitor and Arms Control Association, as well as the Partners for Today, which Brian mentioned at the start of the day. But I wanted to leave on an optimistic note. We are going to keep at this. Um, I wanted to just tell you a few of the events that I know the forum is part of, but we also, through the forum, the goal is to raise the voice of this entire community. So if you follow our Twitter feed or get on our newsletter, you can see many other events that are happening, reports that are coming out. Colby just launched one today. But I wanted to put on your calendars some things that are happening. You may not know when he left, unfortunately, but in this country right now, all high school debaters who are part of high school debate leagues around the country are debating whether or not we should reduce arms sales. That is the debate topic for this school year. Um, and a number of us have participated in debate camps or gone out to schools uh, to be a part of this. But actually, on February 6th, we're going to have uh, four debaters from the Washington Urban Debate League. So there's a league in, the US, in a lot of cities, including in DC, that really are trying to make this more democratic, get to the urban schools, not just the elite schools that I went to when I did debate way many years ago. Uh, so on February 6th, we're going to have a mock debate where you can see how high schoolers are grappling with these issues and thinking about it. And three of us will um, critique that debate and sort of say, oh, this sounds right, this doesn't sound right, so on and so forth. But I think it'll be really fun for adults to see how uh, high schoolers are kind of grappling with this. Um, Melissa Dalton at CSIS and Andrew uh, Alex Wagner at AIA are going to join me in critiquing, so we're going to have a real diversity of perspectives. Um, on February 19th, coming up, uh, Jody Vittori, who is still, is she might have left, but she uh, is going to be on a panel on looking at these issues in the Middle East that are going to take a little bit of a broader view. And on April 21st, Stephen Hargarden, who is here, he was a, he's a doctor, is actually putting together this great symposium on the, arm, the gun trade with Central, and Me Central America and Mexico. We're going to grab, grab a whole lot of different voices on what can be done around this issue. That's just some of the stuff that's happening. Also, be on the lookout for a statement from this community about what the responsible arms trade could be that a number of us might try to sign on to to inject into the conversation. We have a lot going on in Congress. We have a lot going on in the election this year. So there's a lot of places where these conversations can happen. I want to thank you all for being a part of it today. And please join us uh, at the reception. And thanks again. <laughs>